Jeez. When you're ready, Sam. Oh, All good. Okay. Thank you. Well, yeah, I, I hear it's your third day, so <laughs> well done. Um, so, as I said, this is a personal submission that, that I'm making, and this is this is not actually a target that I'm showing on the screen. This is my my um, my attempt to to just show visually the the size of the current live-in footprint, um, and, and I mean, obviously you've, you've read my submissions, and I've made some comments around around the growing footprint of our community and the challenges with transport um, and the opportunities with transport, especially active transport. Um, so what, what a, I mean, this is not, not to scale, but it's reasonably close. So that inner circle shows a one kilometre radius from the town centre, and that outer circle shows a two, two kilometre radius from the town centre. And if you look at um, data across the country, and, and I'm sure this would apply in the Horofanua, a significant proportion of short trips, and by short, two kilometres or less, are made in a private vehicle. And that has significant impacts. And we, as a, as a community, are growing. And if we look at our neighbours, such as Palmerston North, or even look further afield, such as Hamilton, my view is that we don't necessarily want to emulate the approach that they've taken. They, they have spread out um, with, with low-density housing, creating an environment where it's almost impossible to get around without owning a private vehicle. And if I look ahead where this district is heading, I fear that we're heading in, in a similar direction. And, and, and I think there's an opportunity to look at things differently. And that if we look at that footprint there, um, the, the number of dwellings in that area, there's certainly opportunity to, to increase the number of dwellings by a, an order of magnitude and, and the number of people that reside in that area without needing to put more infrastructure in, um, or certainly not needing to put more roads and pipes in. So, so I guess part, part of my, my challenge is how, how can the long-term plan um, allow us to, to not have a community that sprawls out and, and affects future generations negatively? So that, that's um, really the first part of my question, well, first part of my submission. Uh, then I've taken a, another view. So, so when I look through your long-term plan, and the budget allocated for cycling, I think it's great. Uh, there, there's a real increase in, in cycling infrastructure budget. And looking at some of the work that has been undertaken recently in the Levin Township uh, for cycling infrastructure, it, it looks like high quality work. But I, I do have a concern there. And, and the concern is be, uh, creating new spaces for people to, to travel around is really expensive. And when I look, I mean, the, the, I'm not a planner by any means, but we're, when I look at uh, the area of Levin, and, and what I've highlighted here uh, is some of the higher traffic routes through the, the community. And I, I've excluded um, Oxford Street from that because I mean, there's challenge for the NZTA have much more involvement in that. But the, these other streets that I've highlighted, um, help to indicate where, where a lot of the traffic movement is happening. But the, this is people moving around our communities. And, and thinking back to that previous image, the majority of these movements are within a, a two-kilometre radius. And the majority of these roads are quite wide. There is plenty of space to allocate for cycling infrastructure, safe, separated cycling infrastructure, without needing to build new infrastructure. And, and so part of my message is... now. I can't be certain about the, the budgets you've allocated and how far it would go if you took a different approach. But what I'm asking is, if you looked at, at delivering cycling infrastructure in a, in a different way, reallocating existing road corridors for cycling purposes rather than building new infrastructure for cycling purposes, I, I suggest 
that you could achieve a lot more community outcomes and benefits for the same dollar, for the same expenditure. So, so it's really about taking a, a different approach for deli- looking at those out- outcomes. Um, it, it, as I said, I, I certainly support the, the intention of, of spending more money in active transport. And, and there's um, plenty of research about the benefits of, of active transport. So predominantly that's cycling and walking. And, and there's health benefits, there's environmental benefits, there's social benefits, there's um, education benefits. Uh, so, that, yeah, there, there is a wide range of benefits, including um, economic benefits. So you don't have to look far to find that research to back it up. The outcomes can be achieved and can be positive for the community. And I think the final point that I'll make there, um, and, and I heard this yesterday from the, um, the health submission that, that I was listening to um, from the, well, basically from the DHB, 20 25% of the population don't hold a driver's licence. So when we're looking at transport in our community, uh, if we're prioritising um, car transport over other forms of transport, then we're leaving 25% of the population behind. I think I'll leave it at that. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Sam. Um, any questions for Sam? Sorry, Deputy Mayor James. Sorry, um, Sam, could you just turn yours off while the questions come? Thanks, Sam. I appreciate that submission, and I did see you whizzing along Oxford Street as I was arriving at Council today. Well done navigating that bit of road. <laughs> hey, um, and we had a submitter yesterday who spoke at length um, about cycling around Levin, having been a cycler and a previous district and now she won't cycle around this area because she thinks our roads are too unsafe. But you're saying that with some modifications we could easily make our existing roadways quite safe for commuter use and for getting kids to and from school. Is that, is that what you're saying? You've got some <coughs> So Maybe not easy, I know, nothing's ever that easy, but, but the, the, in general, the road corridors are significantly wide in, in our community, and, and there is plenty of space to allocate road, road space for cyclists. But the evidence shows that cyclists need physically separated space from vehicles, and I don't know if you've seen the trials in Palmerston North where they've used those planter boxes, but the number of vehicles hitting those planter boxes Every time a vehicle hits those planter boxes, there's someone drifting into the space allocated for cyclists. And, and any of those could have been a, a, um, a, a DSI, a death of serious injury. So it's not just giving space, it's physically separated space. But my point is on the existing road corridor rather than building new infrastructure. And education around driver behaviour, given that there are people drifting into that space and hitting those planter boxes and everyone's saying, what a stupid idea, but actually, in fact, what about the person driving the car that hit the plant box? What's the answer to education around driver behaviour and driver tolerance towards other road users? Well, I think it's a culture, and, and, and culture takes time to develop, and culture takes time to change. And, and right at the moment, it is often a surprise for a, a vehicle or a driver to, to see a cyclist on the road. So they're not necessarily expecting to see a cyclist, but creating a space where it's safe to cycle, the perception from parents that it's safe for their children to be cycling to school. Um, so that, it's about changing the culture. Education is part of that. Infrastructure is part of that. Having the police on board. I mean, it, it, there's no single lever that can be pulled, but um, the, the, the council has the ability to, to pull a number of those levers. Yes, I'm you. Thanks, Sam. Um, you said that 25% of the population doesn't drive. Is that 25% of the adult population, or does that include children? That includes children, but that, and, but it's all relevant figure because 
children also want to move around our community, to get to school, to get to sport, to go and see their friends. And, and at the moment, we, we see the end of the school holidays, we see first day of school, the traffic volumes increase, and, and that's movements of children to school. Yeah, just a comment. When I was teaching at Fairfield School, hardly any children biked to school. But when we had bike safety days, when they needed to bring bikes for the course, everybody had a bike, but they didn't ride on the road because they perceived it to be dangerous. Um, oh, sorry. Councillor um, could, could you put your map up there of the those in red? Yeah, that one. Um, assuming you know more, you will, I see you biking all the time, but um, how safe or not, or how, at the same time, I hear you talking about using the existing dollar, um, so within budget, potentially, you, you're envisaging this would work, um, but how complementary or how could, say, um, older people on their scooters, because that's increasing in number, um, use these same routes? Because yeah, you have marked out, I guess, the main trunk line which they use, um, but do they work together, yes or no? I mean, I, I'm not a user of either, so I'm just... And I mean, we've always got conflict between transport modes. Um, so what you're talking about is micro-mobility. It's your um, scooters, skateboards, um, mobility, scooters and the likes. And often footpaths are appropriate for them, but, but not always, um, with, depending on the condition of the footpath vehicles parked on footpaths, and I've spoken to this council previously about that. Um, intersections are, are challenges. So, so what I'm talking about is predominantly cycling infrastructure, allocating part of the existing road corridor for cycling, um, and, and that helps to keep cyclists off the footpaths um, and, and helps ensure that it's safe for pedestrians and, and micro-mobility on that existing infrastructure. So um, there's nowhere else in New Zealand that you're aware of that, that, that have the two running on the same? No, probably not. Oh, there's certainly shared pathways around the country, and, and I mean, even Queen Street um, walkway is like that. But often the shared pathways are leisure pathways. What, what this is focused on is moving people from A to B to go about their lives, and, and there is a, a different need there. So, Jenny, um, Sam, in some areas, um, to accommodate what you're suggesting around, I guess, repurposing part of the existing roadway, it would, on my understanding, necessitate either sort of removing on-street parking from perhaps one side of the road at least, or perhaps turning some roads into sort of a one-way system. Is that is that correct in terms of, for some of these arterial routes, those are the kind of the changes that would need to happen to actually facilitate what you're, you're looking at? I, I wouldn't envisage any need for one-way systems. Um, I, again, I'm not a, a planner, so I mean, there's detail behind this, but, but certainly we, most of these routes are wide streets and, and there is space for um, continuing to allow for parking and, and dual carriageway and dual cycleways it may mean that in some streets par um, parking would need to be on one side only. The majority of these streets, when you look around, it, there's very little car parking on them. Probably the, the main one would be Lower Bath Street, outside the, um, the Arts area. Um, so the corner of Bath and, and Cambridge. That's probably the main one where, where there's quite a bit of parking on a regular basis. The majority of these other streets don't, don't actually have a lot of car parking on, used on them. And I mean, it's easy to, to get out there and have a look, and so I do pay attention to that. 
Appreciate that, Sam. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting. And I assume you'll send us those little maps that you um, had there. They were quite interesting, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Appreciate I, that. I've sent those through already. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, appreciate you coming. Thank you. Um, so that was a good start, councillors, 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, everyone's an important topic. <laughs> eh? Well, I'll make sure that next time, yeah. <laughs> Lou, would you like to join us at the table? Thank you. So uh, welcome, Lou, and I know you, um, from reading your submission, you've been coming to this table for a lot longer than most of us have ever been around, so um, welcome again, and thank you for uh, taking the time to make a submission. We look forward to it. Thanks. Thank you, um, Mr Mayor, um, and good afternoon, uh, District Mayor and Councillors. Um, as I've just done, um, I do appreciate um, the opportunity to uh, to speak to you, and uh, you have um, my thanks already. <clears throat> um, ladies and gentlemen, the District Mayor has indicated that you will have read my detailed submission, and I trust it is only necessary to emphasise my main observations and answer any questions you might have. My issue with the draft long-term plan is that it is fundamentally flawed, being based on policies and assumptions that completely disregard the economic realities of Horofenua and, in particular, the seriously impoverished characteristics of the main centres of Levin, Foxton and Foxton Beach. Further, in my opinion, it does not conform to the requirements of the Local Government Act 2002, which in Section 10.1 and 14c requires that in performing its role, a local authority must act in accordance with the principles related to the importance of the interests of communities as differentiated from businesses. I believe this district cannot survive <coughs> as a stable economic entity unless the existing policies favouring opportunity and patronage of businesses, particularly farming businesses, together with the subsidisation of higher valued urban property at the very considerable expense of costs of ownership and rental occupancy of low to middle income urban properties are immediately reconsidered and effectively reversed. <clears throat> there are many opportunities available to Council to honour its obligations to improve the financial well-being of our communities. For a comprehensive understanding of the scope for relieving the burden on low to middle value urban households, the 2008 publications of the Society of Local Government Managers, namely, uh, one title being Developing Local Authority Revenue Systems, and the other titled No Magic Answers, 
are a good place to start. To quote just one example in the proposed long-term plan, I suggest you reconsider the apportionment of costs to the farming and district-wide differentials for the general rate in the 2021 to 2041 draft LTP. In the consultation document, it is claimed that the differential has been determined to ensure that farming is levied a general rate contribution that is consistent with its overall proportion of total land value across the district. But closer inspection of the financial statements in the supporting documents, which of course is viewable at this stage only on the Council's website, reveals that where next year, that is 2021 to 2022, a total general rate uh, revenue um, collection of 10,996,000, the farming differential um, actually contributing only 3,056,000 dollars. Where if that was in fact apportioned to land value uh, relativities, that should be very much higher at 4,766,000 virtually. Um, now, correction of what seems to me to be un uh, obvious underbilling would result in a reduction in the general rate component of the total rates proposed for a typical 1960s bungalow from $579 to only $427. I believe that somewhere how um, something needs to be closely and um, uh, specifically clarified in terms of um, your uh, proposals in that area, to just mention one, uh, one place where it seems to me that it deserves a bit more study. Now, while this potential saving in the general rate for low to middle value urban households is substantial enough, it is only a small proportion of the rating relief which could arise from a community well-being based review of the present Horofinua rating model. Indeed, there is great and legitimate capacity for a council-based initiative toward improving the economic viability of the district by changing policy to people-friendly rather than business patronage. I anticipate total relief available from the above including a review of all targeted rates, might be of the order of 30% for low to middle urban, uh, sorry, middle valued urban households. Ladies and gentlemen, by, by not honouring a commitment to engage in a rate review prior to formulating the draft long-term plan, Council has effectively subjected so many of its households to further unfair and unnecessary impoverishment. This surely cannot be allowed to continue. And that leads me to my recommendations. One, I suggest that Council should proceed immediately with the reintroduction of development contributions 
as described in the consultation document as Topic 2, Option 1, which is applicable to each of the five nominated activities and subject to the first stated form of catchments, namely district-wide contributions for roading and community infrastructure, scheme-by-scheme scheme contribution for the three waters, and growth areas paying for major expenses related to them. And secondly, and this is perhaps the difficult part for you, but I think it's overdue for your community, I suggest that you should, because of a number of uh, uncertainties and matters that need to be clarified, I mean, the major one, of course, is all the growth projections surrounding whether or not O2NL, if I've got that description uh, properly um, referred to, will it, whether or not it will, in fact, review, uh, proceed. All the public knows is that the Minister has assured you it's under review. No more than that. So I suggest that like you did last year, um, which was based on the COVID problem, and it will, I think, um, be pertinent even now to allow for the probability or the possibility that further change might need to arrive until COVID is something we have under control. I suggest that you should suspend all other proposed policy changes pending the completion of a first principles rates review, so as to devise an affordable and sustainable rating model prior to using same as the basis for amending the long-term plan 2021-2041 in February of next year. With, of course, the funding of prioritised operations and CapEx expenditure during next year confined to a similar limit as applied in 2020-2021, plus, of course, the additional proceeds arising from immediate collection of development contributions. Um, I know that that suggests a lot of work, but then again, time to think by simply holding the line uh, for the next 12 months could prove to be a wonderful investment. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Um, we do have time for a question if anyone's got one. There appear to be none, uh, Lou. Look, thank you very much once again. Um, could I just offer the comment, though, that um, if we weren't compliant with uh, the Local Government Act and not doing our job properly, I'm sure Audit New Zealand would have something to say about that. Um, we are checked and made sure that we are doing following all those um, statutes uh, responsibly and prudently. So I, I do sort of challenge that statement a little bit, that we're not compliant with that act. Well, thank you, and that signals to me that an intimate uh, get-together, perhaps between myself and councillors, because it's important that councillors are aware uh, of where I'm coming from, I think that that would um, uh, focus uh, apparent divisions in opinion to a point where there must obviously be a consensus. Um, we're talking always about a matter of degree, a matter of interpretation, a matter of understanding, which is a great challenge for you when you have to contemplate the understanding of your community. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. 
Can I just certainly through you, um, Mayor Wandon, ask perhaps if we could ask the Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Starker, to explain or for the record speak about the affordability review district wide that's being undertaken for Mr. Roller. Is it? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but with my hearing, I'm, I missed the gist of what you were saying, Councillor. Um, I it assume that it will come out in the washing. Oh, it was just to ask Mrs. Starker, the Chief Financial Officer, to, for the record, note that we are um, requesting a piece of work around the affordability of rates across the district that's being undertaken um, presently. So, I don't, are you aware of that? Look, um, it's embarrassing, but your voice, I'm sorry, does not carry well enough to me to be confident that I can answer or interpret your uh, wishes. If I was able to approach you, that would be um, another matter. So, um, the Deputy Mayor was just informing you that we are carrying out a piece of work around the affordability of rates uh, at the moment ourselves, so that it is informing us for this long-term plan. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Welcome, Councillor Allen. So our next submission is from uh, Sport New Zealand. So is it Colin and Julian? Welcome. Welcome to the Horror for Noah, and um, nice to have you here. I hope you've, um, have you driven the road from Wellington this morning? Yeah, we have, yeah. I hope you didn't have to leave too early. Um, but it's... A while ago. Uh, well, <laughs> nice to have you here, and uh, thanks for coming. Um, so, over to you. Okay, uh, look, thanks for the opportunity to verbally support our submission. As you can hopefully appreciate, we have a significant number of submissions underway at present but we're really keen to be here face-to-face -face with you to support our submission, particularly with the changes that we made after we originally submitted. Uh, my name's Colin Stone. I'm the Regional Partnership Manager for Sport New Zealand for the Central and Lower North Island, and with me is my colleague Julian Todd, who's our lead for Spaces and Places and our Spaces and Places team. Uh, firstly, we would like to open by acknowledging the important contribution that councils make to the play, active recreation and sports sector with important facilities, open spaces, parks and reserves supported by an engaged staff who work hard for their communities and take pride in what they do. We also acknowledge councils' commitment to wellbeing and the role that physical activity plays in contributing to healthy, active and more connected communities. Sport New Zealand is the Crown Agency for Play, Active Recreation and Sport with a vision of everybody active, aligned to government's wellbeing agenda. Our focus for the first four years of our 12-year strategy is on young people, 5 to 18 years of age, our Tamariki and Rangatahi. In particular, through our investment into our partner organisations such as the regional sports trusts, national sports organisations, national recreation, education and disability organisations and through close, closer alignment and support with key regional stakeholders such as Horofanua District Council, we are working to reduce the decline in physical activity levels for our 12 to 18 year olds where the drop off is quite significant and to increase the activity levels for those Tamariki and Rangatahi where the barriers to physical activity are greater and as a result there is less activity. In providing this oral submission, we firstly wish to acknowledge that Council has a small but growing relationship with Sport Manor 2, which we are encouraged to see. We see Sport Manor 2 as our strategic partner and the regional leader organisation for the play, active recreation and sports sector, and an organisation that plays a key role in pulling together various strands of our sector together at the regional level in order to tackle head-on the regional priorities in an aligned and collaborative way. Direct investment and support to Sport Manor 2 will enable the organisation to be more impactful and regionally influential, which we believe will benefit not only this council, but also the local community. 
In respect to sport and recreation facilities, Horofunu District Council is one of seven uh, local authorities collaborating with our regional sports trusts of Sport Manawatu and Sport Wanganui on the development and implementation of the Manawatu Wanganui Regional Facilities Plan, which council uh, with a clear gives, which gives council a clear strategic evidence-based view of sporting infrastructure priorities to enable better investment decisions to be made and a better spend for the ratepayer. This plan is soon up for review and we would encourage Council to proactively continue and contribute to this review process. With respect to the long-term plan, we would ask Council to um, view all of its work through a physical activity and wellbeing lens. So, for example, how can the proposed upgrades to parks and open spaces such as Donnelly Park, Oldham Park, Foxton Beach and Plyford Park be a catalyst for increased physical activity and how does Council activate these parks and reserves and turn passive areas into truly active zones? Uh, we have some specific comments relating to the long-term plan and Foxton. And before I hand over to my colleague, Julian, uh, we did wish to acknowledge Council's thinking regarding the potential development of the sports hub concept in Foxton. There are a significant amount of real-life examples around the country of sports hub models um, to draw on. I myself am chair of a significant sports hub in Hutt Valley and Sport New Zealand is about to publish a new sports hub guide which will literally be a step-by-step -step guide to sports hub development. So through Sport Manual 2, uh, Council has lots of options available. Now for some specific comment around Foxton Pool, I will pass you over to my colleague Julian. Thanks, Colin, uh, Mayor Councillor. Thank you very much. Uh, we thought it was really important uh, that we give you some explanation as to the change of our submission in respect of uh, Fox and Paul. Uh, I want to assure you this is something that is pretty rare for Sport New Zealand to do. Um, our initial assessment and submission was made based on the LTP consultation documentation. And from our perspective, an option that saw an aquatic facility being retained in Foxton for the benefit of that community was important. And given that another option was to permanently close the facility, we made our submission supporting Council's preferred option. After making our initial submission, we had the opportunity to review the feasibility study for the pool development, but it was done by Visit Solutions, Architecture, HDT, Deloitte and NPM projects. Having reviewed that study, we agree with the consultant team that option one provides the strongest overall option and delivers the strongest benefits to the community and council. We acknowledge that council is facing several challenges that population growth is generating and that option one represents the greatest capital cost and subsequently greatest net impact on rates. However, in our view, it also provides the greatest possible impact for the community. Crucially, this option sees the development of a facility which will be far more attractive to Tamariki and Angatahi and therefore become a destination for families in the north of the district. This option responds directly to Council's stated aim of taking the opportunity to leverage the growth being experienced to make the district even better than it already is. We know that in the feasibility study, option one scored the highest in the evaluation of all the options proposed, and through engagement with the local community, that there were high levels of support for additional components to be included and for the appeal of the facility to be improved. Our view is that option one best caters for the needs of the community now and into the future, particularly given the population growth that has occurred and is expected to continue. We are mindful that in these circumstances it can be tempting to undertake the basic option now with a view to expanding and extending the facility later. Experiences from other aquatic projects would indicate that this approach can be problematic, sometimes with significant construction challenges, particularly in uh, respect of seismic requirements and pool water services, which usually means higher construction costs overall. In addition, such extensions often mean that efficiencies in the operation of the facility are limited, with unnecessary operational costs being, being incurred on an ongoing basis. Finally, we note that the decision on the future development of the Levine Aquatic Centre is not scheduled to take place until 2027. Proceeding with option one for Fox and Paul, would help the overall network of facilities to absorb some of the demand the district has until the decisions and actions regarding the aquatic centre are made. 
So we thank you for the opportunity again to be able to speak with you today and we're happy to try and answer any questions that you might have. Councillor Brannigan. Sorry, Julie, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> From my uh, questions to Colin, uh, Colin, around the sports hub that you talked about and you were obviously aware of the conversations uh, being had in Foxton around that. Um, I was part of that, that initial um, conversation, um, which is throwing up some, some, some brilliant ideas and, and I think potential. Um, I think what you're talking about is um, there's, there's models around the country um, in terms of how that's been successful and whatnot. Um, so the thing we spoke about that night um, was around yeah, potential collaboration of, of all the clubs, um, of facilities, sports fields, that sort of thing. So is there, is there examples around the country of collaboration with the likes of local colleges, um, sharing you know, council facilities, merging with local colleges, those sorts of things, and sports clubs, etc.? Is that sort of something you're having experience in or seeing? Yes, there are. Look, and I might just defer that to um, Julian, who is actually one of the architects of our Sports Hub guide, so he can give you some really good examples. Yeah, um, there certainly are plenty of examples um, around the country, um, both uh, examples where they sit on council land and some where they sit on Minister of Education land. Um, there can be different uh, limitations depending on whose land it is and what can and can't happen on that land. Um, certainly, the guide that we've developed is not a it's not a um, uh, a do this do that approach. It's very much uh, comes from the basis that every situation is unique in some respects, and therefore it takes the parties and the groups involved through a series of questions that we think they need to answer based on experience around the country fundamental questions to answer right at the front end to ensure they get the right outcome at the very end. Uh, and that we're launching that new guide in two weeks' time. Deputy Mayor Joan. Oh, thank you, Mayor Wondelak. Thank you for your submission. And just a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, in your written submission, you speak about active transport improvements, and we've had a couple of previous submitters, and I don't know if you heard our earlier submitter today talking about active transport and um, alignment with using um, or, or repurposing probably some of the white streets we've got so that um, they're more available for cyclists and for, for active transport. I just wondered if, as a um, Sport New Zealand, you had any um, opinions about whether encouraging cyclists on on roadways was, you know, whether you had some ideas about that or where it's being done successfully because it's quite low in uptake in our district. So so where your alignment might sit there. So that's my first question. And I don't know if you want to answer that and then I'll answer the second one or do you... I'll certainly try and answer the first one. Um, uh, it's important probably just to state that while... We, we support active transport on the basis that it, it provides opportunity um, for everybody to be uh, active, which is fundamentally what we're, what we're about as an agency. Um, we ourselves have no uh, policy statement in respect of active transport, so we leave that to um, NZTA. Uh, we, we, we have not as yet adopted our own policy um, in respect of that, um, and we are extremely aware of safety concerns in terms of um, road corridors uh, and use of that for active transport. But as I say, we've not, uh, at this point, um, made a statement as an organisation in respect to that. Yeah, Thank you. And my second question was just um, in response to your submission for option one around the of the Fox and Pool and um, the uh, full uh, full indoor outdoor leisure pool that comes at a cost of over nine million dollars to our district and that cost would fall across our district to ratepayers if we chose that option. Um, is there any other funding that you know of available that might make that an attractive proposition for us rather than it falling upon the ratepayers? So, in our view, looking at the documentation that we have, I think you've got a, a good case um, 
for funding from other sources. So um, certainly with projects like this, we have seen um, lawyers fund pro projects like this. Uh, we have certainly seen um, other funders, regional funders, come to the party on projects like this. And uh, at this point, we can advise that we would support those applications. And it's probably worth council knowing that we are, we provide expert advice to lotteries in terms of community facilities and regional uh, and significant projects um, as, as experts. We're the, we're the only sector that gets the opportunity to do that. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate the fact that you've um, come up the road today um, and the fact that you thought it was important to uh, present yourself personally. Uh, that is uh, noted and, and purely uh, we, we do appreciate it. Um, our pleasant journeys and safe travels back home. Thank you. Thank you. So we're now going to have Sport Manor 2, and um, Brad, is it? Yep, and Trevor, yep, thank you, welcome. So thanks for coming from the other part of the, 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 the northern part of the region, uh, and welcome again. I know you've been here a number of times, Trevor, so good to see you here, and thank you uh, too for appearing. And we'll leave it to you. Akirotato, Tene Tumia Chika Kutu, Mutenewa, Nodeira Tena Kutu, your worship. Yakuru Rangachira Mang, Amurangi, Hapa Yuki Murikan, and Ami Kiatosu Katsu, Mokutu Kaha, Mokutu Maya, Mokutu Manu, Pana, Itene Mahi Rangachira, Nodeira Tena Kutu, Tena Kutu, Kuru Matsu Katsu. Um, Your Worship, the Mayor, Deputy Mayor and Councillors, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity for us to present our submission today. Um, and we really value the opportunity to, to present and, and have this conversation. Um, I'm going to take our submission as read, and I'm going to really just highlight a couple of key areas and hopefully generate some potential questions. Uh, and again, just noting from uh, our colleagues from Sport New Zealand, um, Julian and, and Colin, who have come up today, which is fantastic. They obviously knew that the weather was much better up this way, so um, it's great to have them here to support uh, this process. Um, and, and I will be interested in touching on some of the points that were made around uh, facilities, active transport, and the pool um, situation as well. But what I want to do today is just really focus on three key things. One, within our, within our submission, our strategic plan, uh, regional leadership, and strategic partnership. Those were all contained within the submission, but those are the three that I'm going to highlight the most. So first and foremost, uh, Sport Manawatu uh, has been in existence since 1987. Uh, we were put together by a small, passionate group of community members who thought it was a really good idea to support the sector. Um, and we uh, have grown from small beginnings to being a provider of, of uh, services and events ben benefiting the sport and active recreation interests of Manutu, Horofanua, Palmsall City and Tararua communities is our, our catchment area that we work within. Uh, and obviously Sport Manor 2 has a long and proud history of supporting and delivering on council outcomes. We have our, sounds flash, as a not-for-profit organisation, our headquarters in Palms North City, our headquarters uh, in Palms North City, but we also have our offices in, uh, at the Manor 2 District Council and the Tararu District Council. So again, as part of our uh, strategic relationship with those two councils. Um, our strategic review, the board... Um, has undertaken to review our strategic plan. So I'd like to just highlight the three other four strategic priorities which we're consulting on. So the first one is really looking at opportunities to participate. And again, we're, what we're looking for there is how communities live more active lives through play, active rec and sport. And again, the, this council has a really important role to play in that process. Um, priority two, regional leadership. 
looking at a strong and capable sector that delivers a diverse range of quality play and active rec and sport experiences. For many years, the, the strategic plan prior to this one talked about um, uh, being more active more often, and so we're focused on more coaches, more this, more that, more, more, more. Now the focus is on quality experiences. It's not just about providing more stuff. So that's um, quite an important point. Our strong foundations, really making sure that as an organisation we're um, sustainable to be able to support our communities and the different providers. And last but not least, looking at partnerships and collaboration. You know, strong and diverse range of partnerships adds value across our sector organisations. So I would encourage you to jump onto our website, sport102.org.nz, uh, where you can find the full copy of our report and place any feedback, or you can do what other councils have done and ask us to come in and formally present our strategic plan with, with my board in tow. So that's always a, a, an opportunity. Um, the second point around regional leadership, uh, the Horofunua, along with the wider region, has a rich history of delivering recreation and physical activity opportunities and sporting success. However, societal changes means the landscape of delivery of, of play, active rec and sport is changing. Um, and again, so what we know is that uh, it's going to be really, really important that, as the two speakers prior talked about, physical health and mental health, health and well-being becomes quite an essential part of, of the notion around physical activity. We also note that uh, council is a major provider of sport and recreation facilities. Um, I think the last time I was here, I think you tried to give us the Foxton pool, if I remember correctly, but I've got a boxing background, so it's easy to forget some of those um, statements. Um, so a focus on facilities is essential. It's important that existing facilities have sufficient investment in renewals and improvements to maintain a network of fit-for-purpose facilities to meet existing needs. New facilities are also required to address the current shortfall and rapid growth in population, which is fantastic for, for this region. Uh, these needs are applicable to both indoor and outdoor spaces. It's critical that investment meets growth, and it's essential that investment is sufficient new facilities meets the demand that will be generated. And again, this leads me to my point and to the support that this council has provided around the development of the regional sport facility plan. So again, I'd like to acknowledge uh, your council staff for their engagement in the plan. And that's uh, Arthur Nielsen, Sean Hester and Brent Harvey have contributed. So we've worked with the seven councils to be able to look at the sport facility planning and what are the things that we need to do around prioritisation across the network of facilities. Just like uh, Colin and Julian talked about the Foxton pool and the network of facilities. So what we're, we're here to do, I know you're focused on your own rohi, your own region, but it's really important that we look at what are the network of facilities that we need to be able to utilise. So that, that plan does that for us, brings all of that thinking together. It brings all of those council people together to have the conversation around how we might prioritise certain facilities and what we might do to support that. So... Again, I think that's a really, really important part, and I really thank this council for their support with this plan. That plan's due to be reviewed uh, and audited all of the council uh, sporting facilities. Um, we found facilities for councils that they didn't realise they had, which was good. Um, and lastly, just in terms of talking about uh, opportunities exist for this council to consider a targeted approach to meet community needs, Lifestyle and family environments will require sport to embrace new delivery styles. They're going to have to deliver in different ways, not ways we've always done things. Changes in the way we participate and consume physical activity means we'll need to adapt to trends and informal participation in recreation. With the changing landscape, the relationship between sport and health will, will require a focus on how to measure impact. With limited resources, strategic partnerships become more important than ever. Which leads me to my last point around strategic partnerships. Sport 102 is well placed to support community uh, activations in partnership with this council. Um, we have a long-standing strategic partnership with three district councils. So that's obviously Pansal City, Manawatu District Council and Horofuna District Council. So we have an active recreation advisor, Tarunua. 
Yeah, I didn't. Oh, that was a Freudian slip. So it's Tararua, Manawatu, and Palmerston North City, and soon to be Horofanua, one would hope. Um, we have active recreation advisors in each one of those um, districts, and it enables us to provide the support that's needed on the ground around this type of work, both in terms of facility provision, but also around activation. We maintain, obviously, our links with Sporting Z and all great. Did they read out those words that we wrote for them? No, thanks, Colin. That was fantastic. Uh, and it's great to have their, their support, their level of expertise to support us whilst we're on the ground doing face-to-face. -face. Their expertise um, with us is really helpful. So what I'm saying is, you know, I am... I think when I spoke here last time, one of the councillors, and I can't remember which one, sorry, said, how come we can see Sport one or two cars driving around our region but not Sport Horofanua cars? And again, that's part of this ongoing discussion around the strategic partnership and what support we can provide this council. Um, and that largely is about building a network across the councils and being able to support uh, each other. So again, we, we see a, a really unique opportunity to, to develop that partnership. So again, I just want to thank the Council for listening uh, to my presentation. There is another point here, I would say. Uh, this financial year, Sport Manawa 2, through the Two Manawa funding, which was provided by Sport New Zealand, to, to look at supporting young people to be active, uh, for the Horofanua region, we've distributed over 150,000 to this community. And again, which is fantastic in terms of being able to support activation and support young people to be active. But we're looking to change the model. We're looking to devolve decision-making for this fund to communities. So it's a lot easier for us to do that in those communities where we do have boots on the ground and being able to support what we're going to be doing in terms of the devolving of that fund. So again, we haven't got final approval from Sport NZ. Great to see you too. Um, but again, we, that gives you an impression around the way in which we want to work in empowering our communities to have those opportunities around decision making, which enables us to be able to sit alongside our sport, active rec and play providers around delivery and around getting everybody in the Horofanua active. Kia ora uh, Any hard questions? <laughs> That's right, Gordon. It sounds like uh, the two organisations are going to have a quick cup of coffee after this uh, meeting anyway, by the, um, the tone of the conversation. Uh, Councillor Browning. Yeah, uh, thank you, Trevor, and Brad, good to see you. And thanks, Brad, for facilitating the conversation and Fox and recently around the Sports Hub. Um, just wonder if you could briefly outline um, the Sports Hub concept to councillors who probably aren't up to, up to what the conversation's about. Um, the value of, of what we talked about that night around the collaboration of those sports efficiencies and, and the power of, uh, of getting kids out and doing stuff. So, if you could mind. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to talk to that. So, um, I think where that stimulated from was a stakeholder within that community um, seeing value in, um, in developing their venue. Um, and um, the, the promise uh, being that um, it would uh, enable um, groups to come together, um, develop the relationships needed to then provide opportunities um, for young people within that community. But what tends to happen with, with these types of um, all the initial um, concepts is the focus is on the where, not the why. So our role was to come in based on our mahi um, through the Regional Sport Facilities Plan, and this was really looking at local level. So this is for that community, by that community, and it was teasing out ideas why, what was the intent of the sports hub to begin with. Um, concurrent to that was probably additional or, or other conversations that were occurring outside of, of that environment, and what we were wanting to, to do is, exp is explore who else should be at the table. And so part of the sports hub is it may not be about sports. Sport could be the incidental outcome of a community identifying what it prioritised. So as a result of that, we've, we've um, subsequently started the ball rolling um, through the uh, community board, which I think is fantastic because that then provides the basis for the conversation to continue to percolate. And I would expect 
that will be using um, the tools as um, Julian um, highlighted earlier to enable us to identify what it, what it could look like in the future. Um, I think Trevor would like to talk about just an example of a sports hub locally. Yeah, thank you, Brad. You asked the question in to Sport NZ around examples of the hub process and stuff. We, we have one right here in, in, in our wider region. In, in Tararua, over in Pahiatua, there's the Bush Multisport Trust. And they're, they're doing exceptional things over there in terms of their work they're doing with the council and with that facility. And it's not just about sport, but the way in which they've brought all of those uh, groups together has been amazing. So again, I would encourage this council, if you want to think about that, and the community board, pop over to Bush Multisport Trust and have a look because it, it's fantastic. Another part to that is, without declaring a conflict of interest, we we actually, the trust has a contract with us where we employ their staff. So it, basically what that means is their volunteer trust can focus on the direction of the facility and we look after the, of the running of uh, the management of the people on, on, on the ground, which that means they end up getting our whole team coming to support them with different events and activities. So it's a really good model. Thank you, guys. Look, really appreciate the fact, again, that you've come down. Uh, we look forward to the development of that strategic plan and we may well uh, take up that invitation to uh, get you back to... Um, see uh, what you're planning, uh, but thanks again for coming down. Cheers. So the next submitter is um, not attending, so uh, I'd like to welcome Janine on behalf of the Foxton Beach Progressive Association. Welcome, Janine. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, Mr Mayor. Great to see my old buddy from the Olympic <laughs> Committee, still with his crazy sense of humour and warm-heartedness. Haven't seen him for a while. <laughs> He's a great guy. We work together really well. Um, I'm going to also, as Trevor did, take it as the submission from the Fox and Beach Progressives is being read. Also, the um, Fox and Beach Te Whirangi Community Plan that we put together last year. We know that you've take that home and read it at night, you know, every night. I uh, just uh, want to touch on a couple of particular things. The major project for us, two of them, uh, this year is to have a really good look and find some solutions to the damage that's being done on the beach and the dunes in particular by vehicles. And I'd like to encourage you to come up with a scheme maybe to review the bylaws so that we can put in place some rules and signage and consequences for people who are just absolutely destroying our environment down at uh, Boxton Beach. So that's the main thing I'd really like to impart to you. Very important. Remembering that when we put our community plan together, the number one focus for our community was the uh, care and the protection of our environment. And honestly, it's just crazy. The number of vehicles, idiots. Um, we've got our big dune garden out there that, that several of us look after and is amazing and all the natural animals and uh, plants and reef come back and then we get cows just, you know, it's not right. It needs to be fixed. I'd encourage you to have a look at that. Uh, the other big thing I'd really like to encourage you to do is to support Foxton, Foxton Beach and lots of other downstream communities when we think about what Palmerston North City Council wants to do with their wastewater. They work in Palmerston. <laughs> we, um, we're the recipients of everything in our mighty Manawatu. We don't want anyone else's wastewater or plastics or dead cows or anything like that. 
they land up literally at our doorstep. We'd really like and need your support to make sure that the Palmerston North people look after their own wastewater and don't put it into our waterways, whether it's out to sea or in our river um, or on our land. Keep it to themselves, please. Very important. Um, just a little bit of an update. Trevor was talking a lot about welfare and well-being. Uh, vitally important, particularly gets more and more important with mental health issues, physical inactivities, perhaps. And I'd like to talk to Trevor about ideas around uh, exercise and, and things for older people as well, because this community has got quite a high proportion of oldies. So uh, we will focus on kids, and that's fantastic for sport and recreation. Wellbeing goes right across the board, and there's a lot of oldies who need to get up and get going, isn't it, David? <laughs> <laughs> Personal attacks won't be tolerated. <laughs> no, it was tongue in cheek because he goes running. You see, you see him just about dying on the road sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the community, the, not the community board, the Progressive Association is making really good, strong relationships with our community centre at the moment to form um, alliances with what we can do collaborative, collaboratively with them looking after the well-being and the people and us looking after the, the broader perspective. So things are going really well. Happy to take any questions. Um, despite destroying relationships with your locally uh, elected members. Um, any questions? Councillor Allen. <laughs> <laughs> the no two involved here at all. Um, no, just a, on a serious note, uh, Janine, the Progressive Association now has a strong, a strong mandate associated with the community that it represents, and the community plan, which is adopted by Council, reinforces our relationship with you also. With that in mind, specifically on the Foxton pool, and of course the elephant of the room is the cost, the nine million for option one, which the Progressive Association supports. Do you have a sense of how the community there would feel about um, the freeholding account being a funder for funding some of the costs involved? Yeah, David, we do. Um, not the community at large, because you've only just posed that question to us. Um, but certainly within my committee, we there is a, a, a majority of us, haven't been able to talk to everyone, uh, who feel that it is a very positive thing for everybody in the whole district, not just Foxton or Foxton Beach. Um, the facility would be amazing for everybody, and I think it's a great experience you know, a great way to work, to spend some of the freeholding fund money. You know, we've put half a million dollars into Te Waiora, which council gifted the land for, which was amazing. We put $500,000 into Te, Wa Te Awahu Nui School, which, look at that, that's an incredible facility, changed the face of Foxton. Um, and we actually have put, I believe, money into the pool previously as well. So we don't want to waste that money that we've already invested, and that's another aspect. But to invest another, and that's the, the people that I have talked to that have answered and said, given me their thoughts, are saying, in principle, we really do support that, but we need to know the detail, obviously, of how much that might be and everything else. That answer? That was easy. If you leave me a rest. I oh, thank you, Mayor Wanda, and I do need to declare before this that I am a member of the Foxton Beach Progressive Association, but I don't think that will impact on my ability to make unbiased decisions. However, look, I, we had a really good uh, submission from the New Zealand Four Drug Association talking about the McKenzie Trail and concerns last night about uh, some of the um, damaging behaviour out there at the beach and the dune damage. And has it got worse? Like, is it something that's getting worse and worse? And how is it dealt with now? Yeah. Thanks, Joe. I look across the estuary from my front room and watch the vehicles daily. 
daily, motorbikes, cars, utes, trucks, up and over, round and round and round. It's getting really bad, really bad. And we've got no, we've got no clout, we've got no leverage to say get off. There's no signs, you know, what, what is the law? So... I was just going to ask that, Janine. You talked about bylaws. There's no current bylaw. You're asking us to. I'll hand that to Ross. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a question on that too. Um, no, there's, there's current bylaws on the beach in terms of speeds and certain things, but not not particularly about driving over the dunes. Um, but I think that will be the conversation. Yeah. So, but I will ask Janine the question. Thanks, Janine, Mike, and thank you, and thanks for the work, work you and the team done. Because you really are making a difference out there, and and, and um, supporting things that um, that need doing. And uh, the council, as you know, the council can't do it all on their own. We need groups like yourselves to to play the part and represent the community, but also put the you do the money. Um, my question is around the the June work that we know need. Well, this, sorry, not just the June stuff. The overall environmental management on that June field out there and surrounding history and what not needs doing. And, and I think, uh, like, like me and other councillors and community board members, if we see the work being done by the History, history Trust and the, the History Management Team, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of the overarching thing, I think we, we accept needs to be done in terms of the June management, ongoing management, creating the bylaw perhaps, um, yeah, but, but also managing that, that ongoing, um, um, yeah, uh, facilitating that ongoing management of that area. Do you see that the Manitou Estuary Management Team could do that, or do you think it needs to be a far smaller, more focused team working alongside Council and the other, other statutory managers that we can't now thought of? That it's just it's, it's a team effort. But, yeah, just interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks, Ross. I think, in principle, the management, Estuary Management Team do a great job in the time that I've been involved with it. Um, We've gone from siloed interest of different statutory, the three main statutory bodies, working in silos to being much more collaborative now and actually working much closer together. And um, it fe it's feeling a lot better, the, the vibes, you know. Um, Sam Ferguson was here before from Horizons. He, he's fantastic coming along. Um, this council is talking much more with Horizons and, and DOC as required and they are coming up with broader plans. Sean Hester at the moment is putting a, a funding application into Horizons from their biodiversity, new biodiversity fund uh, for a project at the beach in the dunes. I'm not exactly sure what it is but he's doing it in collaboration with the Progressive Association and possibly with NET as well, um, Manual to Estuary Trust. So there feels like everybody, people are all sort of on the same soapbox. We've been along to Horizon several times and spoke, spoken to them about the importance of the environment and working together, and it really feels like they're listening and they are meeting more frequently. Uh, so it feels much more positive and much more progressive. Horizons are also looking to um, designate the Manawatu Estuary as a significant place, which means that, that it will get extra funding and attention. Uh, so that would, when and if that happens, that will be fantastic, especially if the river's got no shit in it. Thank you, Janine. <laughs> it's probably a good note to finish on. Um, can I just uh, to acknowledge and endorse what uh, Ross has just said about the contribution that the Progressive Association is making to the district. And I've just counted up the number of requests in your submission. It totals 37. So you've set us a bit of work, and we understand that, and we will uh, deliberate accordingly. So once again, thanks very much. Thank 
Can I invite the former chair of the uh, Fox and Beach Progressive Association to the table? Wearing another hat this year. Welcome, Ted. From one grey hair to another. Kia tato katoa. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Your Worship, councillors and wonderful members of the staff. Um, I'm here representing my partner, Joy, and I only want to talk about one thing, and that is the Foxton Pool, even though there are other things in the submission that I'm very happy to leave to your deliberations. Um, what seems like half a lifetime ago, I had a job as a hired hand at another council, and that job included looking after recreational facilities as one tiny part of it. And so me and my managers inherited quite a lot of old pools. Um, we were very careful as we were working out what to do with them to ask questions like, what's the, you know, what's the need? Um, how do you do feasibility studies on these things? How do you put together business cases? And we did that. With, that became a requirement of all community facilities development or upgrade in this particular council area. With regard to the aquatic centres, as they became, several things became clear. One is, if you want them to work in this modern era, they have to be aquatic centres. They can't be the old-style swimming pool type affair with a few additions. If you want them to maximise revenues, you have to have all of those features as well. When you do do it, what you tend to get is a great deal of use by families. And in the context of Foxton and Beach, facing what you people have clearly pointed out is a very large increase in population and also visitors, already commencing in the case of Foxton and Foxton Beach. That seems to me to be a, a, an essential starting point. Now, as I say this, I know that you have this incredible struggle of trying to make a budget for 20 years work, projecting what you think will be the council's revenues and income. But I'm suggesting to you that there is no place for a half assed job on the Foxton pool. And if you do, it will probably not be a good outcome because you won't get the usage and you will come to believe that it isn't really wanted. If you do put in everything that is available to it, and I would just add, maybe crank up the parking a bit, if that can be done reasonably cheaply, I think the reward for the people will be a great deal of usage by visitors and by locals, far and above what it is now, which I think would not be the pattern of the future. All of that being magnified by the very large increase of people that that end of Kuruwhenua is going to get. The only other thing I want to add is that when we were doing this at that other council, we were part of a, a region and um, Attention had been paid to what is the regional need, which sometimes justified not having a certain facility in every one of those local authorities. With aquatic centres, it seemed to be different, and all of our feasibility studies demonstrated to us that they have a local um, aspect to them. Um, the figures that are in the long-term plan um, papers about the rating increase cost. This is putting aside any consideration of the debt levels that you guys have to find a way to manage. In even 10 years, we'll look puny, I think. And I think that should not be a consideration. I know it will be difficult putting together a funding package if there is a decision to do this or a wish to do this. Um, a lot of people at the beach are kind of sour, rightly or wrongly, about the use of the freehold fund money that went into the pool in its earlier development and kind of cheesed that 
that hasn't had a long life. Personally, I think the best way to, to assuage that is to grab another chunk from that fund and do it properly this time. I'm happy to take any questions that you might want to ask me. Uh, thank you, Ted. That was well put. Um, any questions for Ted? Councillor Alfred. So, so I think the last sentence dealt with the question I was going to ask because, I mean, just by the way, councillors are aware of this, but you, your uh, status in the community at the beach, even though you no longer hold the position of chair of the progressives, um, you are someone who, beyond doubt, has a feel for the pulse in that community. So for clarity, you feel that personally there would not be an outrage from the beach people should they be asked to contribute through the freeholding account towards option one? I, I think it would probably be mixed, to be fair, and that was a personal opinion on behalf of my partner, Joy and I, but um, a lot of people I speak to certainly agree, and sometimes they agree once you talk about what it all means and you know, why this would be a really good investment, believing that the other use of the fund for the earlier version was not a good investment. Councillor Brady. Yeah, thank, thanks Ed for, uh, for your words and, and um, good, to, good to see you again, Lenny. Um, you were here earlier when I think uh, New Zealand, uh, sort of support New Zealand were here. I don't think you had arrived. Was that right? You were here when Sport New Zealand uh, spoke before? Yes. Oh, you were? Sorry, yeah. Uh, Oh, right, okay, yeah. So they talked about the uh, the avenues of um, of um, funding streams that could could um, assist this project. Uh, have you had any, in your time, any experience of funding streams? I know it's probably a vastly different time, but uh, any experience there? Well, yes, in that, in that other um, long time ago local authority that I worked at, um, we were making lots of applications to, you know, all the very big funders for a whole lot of projects. Um, they, they weren't big on our aquatic centres, I must confess, but it's all very different now. Um, and, you know, quite a lot of it was ratepayer money, and a lot of it was from ASB trusts, and um, a little bit from lotteries. But even they, and I think it's as true now as it was then, they want they, they are not impressed by people who present a small project. And they're not impressed by a project that's not complete and doesn't have things that maximise revenue while maximising um, usage. So we found, with a number of projects, and one example is, this is giving it away, isn't it, the Bruce Mason Centre in North Shore. Um, it was fairly expensive to put a cafe in it, but it was the reason why the ratepayer got very low operating costs to fund for rates as a result of putting that in. So the funders who were helping us to put together the capital package wanted it in there, whereas even some councillors and locals were saying, God, no, do it later, you know, do it 10 years down the track, which often has a way of never happening. So we got the revenue as soon as the facility opened. Impressively. Thanks, Ed. Really appreciate the, those comments. And I assume you're going to stay there and Mel's going to join you and you're going to talk about your other topic. Welcome, Mel. Um, I'll just declare a conflict there, Your Worship. Thank you. Noted. Thank you. Well, uh, my name is Mel Douglas, and I'm proud to be the chairman of the Horafanua Prevention Camera Trust, who are helping you all to feel safer. Mr. Mayor, councillors, Mr. Clapton, and his very helpful staff, we thank you for this opportunity to make this submission to apply for funding under Council's long term plan. At this point, I would ask a couple of our volunteers to stand so that we can all acknowledge their dedication to the Hyphenhoa Crime Prevention Camera Trust. These people are some of our frontline operators. 
who help the present and future residents of the Horofenua to feel safe. They keep very unsocial hours, regularly operating past midnight. Thanks to you all. The purpose of this application is to secure funding for maintenance purposes, insurance, data transmission and administration costs over the next three years. Our maintenance costs have substantially increased with the addition of Foxton Beach to our network due in part to the environment of the beach. It is very difficult to keep our system operating at peak performance without regular provision of monies specifically tagged for these purposes. We have also made a request for payment of a one-off capital sum of 6.7k, and Ted will explain to you shortly why we have added this to our application. We are currently engaged with our growth and development plan as outlined in our written submission, as well as entering the final stages of the trust restructure due to our merger with the Foxton Beach Progressive Association CCTV project. We will shortly be raising capital funds for the expansion of our network. These expansion plans include the encouragement of those Horofanua communities who are currently without CCTV coverage to join our operation. Operators are being recruited and trained on an ongoing basis as we require greater numbers of those volunteers as more operators equate directly to an improved service to police council and residents of the Horofanua. This will also have a beneficial effect on the development of this region. We are also in need of providing new workstation for operators as the old equipment is well beyond the use by date. The trust, trust sorry, <coughs> recommends that council also give consideration to planning for the additional installation of CCTV infrastructure in the new growth neighbourhoods we were happy to assist in these processes. We are here to help you feel safer. Thank you. I'll now hand you over to Ted. Thank you, Mal. I'll deal briefly with the um, aspect of the special request, additional request for a one-off CapEx payment of 6.76k. In our submission, we make it very clear that we do need to upgrade our ability not only to have our operators operate well with very good equipment, we do need to improve or upgrade the searching that we provide for the police. That is the main reason for our existence. We need to do it as best we can. We can't yet do it as well and as reliably as we want to. We've taken a whole range of professional assessments and they show that we need to do lots of things about the live-in camera system because it's a, it is a big variety of stages and ages and fits. Uh, the server that deals with it is not anything like the specification of the one that's coming in with the Foxton Beach system. And a big part of making it all work better is integrating the two servers together so that both of them perform pretty much to the standard of the new one that's coming in. That's a fundamentally important thing that we've been advised that we should do early. Rather than spend lots of money on fixing cameras, some of the fixing will be done by integrating the servers. Then we can diagnose what is left to fix and swap out change, extend. And I think Mel referred to the fact that um, we don't have cameras in enough places, even in Levin. And we do need to be smart about the way we do that swapping. And it'll be one of the ways in which we extend the coverage. So our money that we currently have in our bank account, and some of it, or a great deal of it, we're grateful for the fact that it's come from Horofano Council in, in two different forms will make a dent in the need to upgrade the workstations that the operators use. That's an essential thing for them. They work really hard and they work really long and they need to get in there and find that the equipment works well every single time. 
currently that's not the case. So we can afford to do that. We can afford to do some camera fixes. We can't yet, and it'll be some time before we get the money from other funders, integrate the service. So we're asking if it's at all possible, could you help us with that chunk of money to do that one thing? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions? Councillor Allen. Look, I absolutely am talking about the, the one off capital application. I absolutely get it that there would be clear advantages to having the money to integrate the services. My question is what what explain to a simple person what the consequences of not being able to integrate the services would be. What does that look like? What are the consequences? Just delays, really. It, the, the risk will be that we spend money that we've got in small amounts on sort of fixes when the, it would be better to see what gets fixed by integrating the two servers. And if I just point out the two, they're very good servers. The one that's coming in is exceptional and has all sorts of characteristics that even blew the police away when it was demonstrated to us. Those of you who watch British um, programs will see some of the things that can be done with their CCTV. This server can do some of those things. The, the one that's already here in Levin is a, is a really good one, but it doesn't have any of those characteristics, and it doesn't have excess capacity. There's a lot of capacity, and it's easy to add capacity to the new ones coming in with Foxton Beach. So just delay, really. We would have presumed we would eventually get the money and we might do it 9, 12 months, 15 months down the track. It would be really, really good to be able to get that done now, and it would make the work the workstations work better and faster, and it would make the live-in camera system, even while we are doing our fixes and getting enough money to buy extra cameras, would make it all work better. Deputy Mayor Mason. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thanks for the work that you do. Um, it's good to know. Just interestingly, you talked about some of the gaps and that there aren't enough cameras about the place, but I'm aware lots of small business owners and, and businesses in the district have their own surveillance or CCTV. Do you have a database of those businesses, or would it be worth having a database of those businesses so that the gaps might be dealt with in the short term, or is that something that sits outside of your no, scope? Um, we don't currently have a database of those people, but I see it as a distinct advantage to have that, because quite often they are complementary. We, well, both systems are complementary, and the more coverage we can get, the better it is. And some of those systems are, are quite high quality. Um, thank you for your submission. Around the crime prevention unit that's part of Ministry of Justice, a number of years ago they used to have a um, specific crime prevention project fund. So I just wondered, is that still in existence and are you able to apply for funding through them as well? There's a very short answer to that. Don't know. Mm -hmm. right. Well, there you go. Good. There's some homework. Yes. Yeah, we'll make a note of that. Thank you. Well, I presume that every town, district in the country has got this same issue around um, providing some sort of um, security camera system in their towns. What do, do you know of what other councils do in this space? Well, some of these systems are actually owned and financed completely by council, but of course are some of the bigger ones. Um, to be honest, we don't know a lot about how the other systems in the country operate, only the, the odd ones that we approached early in our formation. Um, which brings us to another question. I believe there is a need for a national organisation to deal with it, um, in which case issues like this would be discussed. But the advantage of that is we are lacking standards for these systems in New Zealand, um, and also the radio frequency that we operate on is the same as what everyone else uses for their home internet etc and it's nicknamed as the cowboy frequency 
for obvious reasons, and we can get more interference. We need government to actually allocate a frequency specifically for our um, CCTV use. I know that's off the, ta off the subject a little bit, the question asked, but um, I think it's all part of, part of that. Can I just ask quickly one more thing? Just one more quick, really quickly. Um, Lower Hutt and Upper Hutt City Council, so the partnership they have with their crime cameras, do they, they put in about $100,000, is that correct? Between the two to run all their cameras together? That's right. Yeah, probably it sounds right, yes. No, I just add the wish of it. Um, Paddy Doyle, when he was doing the investigative work for Fox for Beach, I thought I'd shut that up. See how strong I am on technology. Um, he he looked at a number of the ones that were within reach of here, and some of the people who made bids to provide us with the system told us about ones that installed in other places. Parts of the South Island, for example, a couple of towns in the South Island have got you know really highly developed um, systems. Some of them provided by the council, and even Dannyburg has a pretty substantial CBD system substantially paid for by the council. Yes. So we're not, we haven't come here to demand that you change tack. But, um, you know, it's, it, it is a, if, if we did an assessment of the war, it would be a very interesting mix. And, of course, a lot of towns have nothing at all. I don't think there is a single CCTV system anywhere in the Manawatu District Council area. If I could add to that, the trust wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for that initial payment from council way back in 2003, 2004. Councillor Jennings. Ted, Mel, um, I understand that you're not, you don't currently have cameras in Foxton Town or Shannon, but you'd like to. Is that the, is that the, the plan? Yeah, we are about to. Well, we have roughly spoken to the people in Foxton, and uh, I think Ted's in the process of arranging meeting uh, for some of the people up there who are showing interest. Um, but that is our plan, yes. And I might add that, you know, before you notice the name change from Horopanua to Levin, this purely came about because of our merger with, with the um, Fox and Beach people, which has been extremely beneficial to the Trust. It has really expanded our horizons, hence the name change, to not just think of Levin, but the whole of the Horopanua. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Ted. I uh, appreciate you coming in and uh, giving that. Obviously, you said it's a challenge, and we will um, deliberate accordingly shortly. Best of luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, guys, for coming in. So we next have the uh, Horofano District Ropers and Re uh, Residents of Ropers Association. Christine, thank you. So you have a presentation for us, Christine. Um, thank you for the opportunity, again, to allow us to be here today. Um, I'm Christine Moriarty, and I'm the Chair of the Residents and Rate Pays Association, and um, Graham is going to do a presentation. I'll try and answer a few questions. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, we've sent in about 20 recommendations. We're just going to look at a few of our priorities. We're looking to get you to deliver results that citizens value at a price that you, we are willing to pay for. So in terms of our priorities, fiduciary duty of care policy, rates affordability, removing differentials, introducing a capital gain, capital gain capital value rating system, saying no to debt increases to 250%, and we'd like you to look at underground development, um, 
primarily focusing on the infrastructure, not overground monuments, and we'd like you to actually present accurate data. So fiduciary duty of care um, came about because a number of people have actually spoken to me about the issue. Um, Wellington City Council, a um, person there, um, policy analyst, talked about what is happening in Wellington City Council. I know that the State Government of Queensland has the process in, in place, and basically there's a legal precedent set out on our submission to show that um, the policy is there. Um, sorry, the legal precedent is there. The court has said that uh, councils should seek to balance fairly respective interests of different groups of, rate, of and categories of ratepayers. So whether we are urban, whether we're rural, whether we're in business or not business, whether developers waged, unwaged, etc., we want a fair go and fair interest processes. So basically, the ratepayers expect the fiduciary principles to apply at all levels of governance and management um, by codifying this legal precedent. So, it's not come up particularly well. Sorry about that. Um, the, there have been past decisions where um, we believe that there has no, been a, a difference in fiduciary duty of care. That is, decisions that have been made by the council, so where we've got dif differentials between 70 and 30% is unbalanced. Development contributions is unbalanced. The sale of ratepayer properties, um, Oxford Street properties, are unbalanced. Um, overcoming resource consent objections, we believe it's unbalanced. And it's the ratepayer who bears the general costs of these things. One of the issues is the property sales. Um, the effect of that was to lower the land value, or, sorry, to decrease just cause a low increase in the land values in the uh, Oxford Street properties compared with other commercial properties. And the effect of that is that the council is missing out on about $100,000 of rates through that process. So the question really for a council is, is do, do councils have the integrity to introduce this legal precedent policy without any principled constraints? If not, why not? We then move to rates affordability. So if we look at various levels of rates after taxes or disposal income, unemployed people, if they're paying the average rates of um, $2,526, an unemployed person will have 9.3K, superannuated alone, 19 and almost 20, a couple, 26, and a minimum wage, which is now 41600 will be paying about $32,000. Now, the minimum wage, most of the people that are here, 70% of the population of Orofino, are actually under the minimum wage level. Now, this, this information from Inf Infometrics this year. Um, compare that with the Selwyn population, which is 47% being under there. And if we look at the total incomes then from the um, 2018 census, we've got a range there showing the majority of people around about 40% or under $20,000. And if we compare that then with the Selden district, we see that they have fewer older people, maybe. Um, I can't remember that part. But they have certainly fewer people under the $20,000 situation. In the Horofrenua, we have a median of 23.9K. The Selden district is 42700 and of those over 70,000, Horofino is 8.6%, Selwyn is 24%. So effectively, the CPR analysis consultants, Larry Mitchell, has said that we are probably 68, 6 out of 66 councils in terms of the composite index of how affordable things are within, the, within all um, metropolitan rural areas. So... We're, we want some accuracy within the legislation, within the, the, the data presented. The legislation requirements, we recognise CAPEX, OPEX, those sorts of things. Um, but 
we recognise that the rating agency requirements may actually be quite different. Where we need to see where the debts are and where they're going to, to lie. Now, the information coming through from your um, LTP documentation shows from year 14 onwards a decrease in the amount of debt, which is the top top line, um, with no particular way to actually show how that's being paid off because the revenue is just static. Um, the certain amount of, of money going on capex dips slightly, but those two figures, those two um, positions don't slope in the same way. If the capex liabilities are coming down, then something else should be going up to counteract that. But that's certainly not there. So we want you to budget for outcomes. We want you to look at a fiduciary care of, quality, of, of policy so that there's equitable decisions being made. We want you to curb the borrowing and selling off of assets. We want you to show transparency that every budget is based on assumptions and can we see those assumptions coming out and a business plan coming through. Primarily, we want you to focus on maintenance and replacement of underground assets rather than building monuments above the ground. And we're certainly aware that we don't want any accounting gimmicks that are going to falsify fiscal problems that are there. And basically, we're going to turn around and say to you, happy deliberations, and we're looking for successful outcomes for all our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Councillors, any questions? Maybe I could start a conversation around household income. I a previous submitter put a table up that um, he had sourced from MB in terms of median household income for the Horofana against and compared that to various other districts. You're, check, you're talking income but individual rather than household income? Individual, yes. Or in the case of a superannuated couple, then it's, it's there as a couple. But those are those are individual um, statistics. Yes, because the statistics that um, had come from MB showed that the average median income had risen something like forty-seven percent in Orofanua over the last twelve years, which compared extremely favourably with what had happened across the country and was far greater than what had happened in Kapiti, uh in Palmerston North and Manor 2. So I, I'm struggling to see, you know, sometimes yep. where um, these figures come from and how they're interpreted uh, can uh, actually change the conversation considerably. Yes, I would totally agree with that. One of the biggest ones is the aged population. That won't change. You know, 60% or 40% of the population is over 65 and we are on superannuation. I'd, I'd, I'd like some clarity on that 40%, because the figures I've seen, it says it's about 26 or 27%. Those are the 2018 figures from the Statistics Department. We are. Yep. Yes. Sorry, Graham, because I'll just ask you to turn that off while the question comes. Um, Mr Lindsay, you've put um, through the presentation Oh, excuse me, um, in your presentation, that the highest priority in terms of the recommendations is around the uh, fiduciary duty of care policy. And so my question is, councillors um, have obligations through the Local Government Act around how they discharge their responsibilities. But I think you pointed to uh, Wellington City Council as being an example of where this type of policy is being rolled out. Are you able to speak to, the, do you know about the, the why? Why are they going down that, that route? What, what are they trying to achieve? Is it... At this stage, we have asked for information. We haven't received it yet. So, sorry, I cannot answer that one. Councillor Brennan. Thank you. you. You referred to uh, Larry Mitchell, the Larry Mitchell um, data. Um, and I'm sure a lot of councillors are probably aware of that, uh, their data gathering and, and how the, their rankings of councils, etc. Do, do you draw data from other 
similar organisations and people, or do you just rely on Barry Richard? Um, the information which I have is limited, obviously. Um, I'm not in a position to afford to pay for the consultation process, unless I charge the $180 an hour, which I suggested last time. Sure, that's not my question. My question is, do you rely solely on the Larry Mitchell data set, or do you get it from other areas as well? Definitely not. Certainly there's other areas. Certainly there are other areas of information, yes. Thank you both. Appreciate the um, the submission, and obviously you've set some um, deliberations for us in terms of where we need to be and what we've got in front of us. And I thank you for your. Um, I too hope we get some successful outcomes for our citizens as well. Leone, uh, please come and present. So the press me button is uh, when you're ready to go. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Leone Brown. Um, I've submitted on a number of topics. I'm not going to address them all. I'm just going to sort of do a brief um, sort of overview and make some comments. Um, I have nothing further to say on the Kopitaroa and the Ōpiki um, submission. I have no more comments on that, so I'll just pass through that. Um, probably nothing further to say about the consents other than what's in the submission. Um, um, other than I would probably like to make a comment about um, the Kopitaroa stormwater discharge where, which is currently um, not yet consented and I'm very confused about how there's all this residential building going on and all these drains being put in without having a consent so I'm quite confused how that happens. And um, the other comment I'd like to make, make is um, about the long-term plan. It's really such a very, very important document in which the community is given 30 days to try and interpret and understand it. It's quite complex. I've hardly sort of touched the bones of it, really, because it's, like, it's so big and so important to... Um, you know, try and consume and understand and interpret, um, let alone, um, um, you know, try and make submissions um, properly on it. Um, and I was just would like to know whether or not the um, council staff could consider that the document comes out a little bit um, longer than the 30-day requirement. Um, and I have suggested that it, uh, comes out, say, 60 days, so the community gets more time to interpret it. And I also think that, you know, with you councillors sitting around there, you've had three days in which to try and absorb a lot of the information from what the submitters. It's, it's a tough ask, and then you've got to come and make it, come up with some decisions around all those submissions. So it is a tough thing, so I think maybe council staff could look to improving that a little bit more. That's, yeah, that's what I want to say on that one. Um, my next submission was on the water supply, and um, I'm not going to talk to everything that I've um, written in my submission, but one of the things I would like to emphasise is um, I think considering that our water supply is under threat, and that's not, just not here in this area, it's around New Zealand, it's around the world really, and it's a life-sustaining force, without it we don't survive. And I think it's time that some measures were introduced to um, um, make that um, not so much a finite resource. 
And one of those ways that I think that needs to be considered in the long-term plan is the introduction of water rates. I know it will be controversial. But as I uh, watch around the town, I see some willy-nilly um, waste of water going on. And given that um, my understanding is council only have, um, uh, what is it, one day, um, if there was an emergency of any kind. So, you know, it's something that you need to really take seriously and consider. Um, the other thing that I'd like to talk about is community education. And um, there are ways that you can do that in schools of the uh, one of the brilliant ways in which you have a captive audience in which council staff could go into the schools to do a little bit of education and they take that home to the parents. Um, and I also think that um, another avenue that you have to do some community education around water um, is in the Chronicle article that you put out, um, you know, and just repeat a couple of comments. You know, uh, such as what you do around waste, reduce, re reuse, recycle, um, those sorts of things. Um, one of the things that I'd really like to know is also how water taste and odour, that's further down my submission, water taste and odour should not be considered an urgent call out. I think that's a, it's a real, like, Put your hand up, there's something wrong here. If you've got something wrong with the taste in your water and it smells, so why is that not an urgent call out? Um, on. So, on that submission, I have nothing further to say. Um, on development contributions, I have really nothing more to say on that one other than I think that um, they need to be implemented and to take effect immediately. Um, the environment. I really question why there's no money in the long-term plan for the environment. You know, um, there's a, a comments made about it being an outstanding environment and yet... Um, there's not, not even an environment committee. And, you know, that's really, really an important thing given what's going on in today's world um, about what's happening in the environment. And this community in particular has a number of environmental concerns. And I think it would be a very appropriate for an environment committee to be established. And I hope that some community uh, groups would be involved in that committee. Uh, the landfill, as I say, a disaster waiting to happen, and it certainly will given its climate change. And who will bear the burden of that? The community. Um, this is hearsay. Uh, I've heard that um, another cell is planned for the landfill, and I think that would be an absolute disaster. Um, all it needs is a good old earthquake and this, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. Um, one of the things I heard yesterday um, was um, a submission by two people who talked about creating some kind of uh, adventure park in the landfill as a form of remediation in that area, which I thought was a brilliant idea. Because one of the, I come from Christchurch, and one of the areas is the Burwood Plantation, which was a, an old landfill. And so they planted lots of pine trees on them, and then they created this great adventure park, which the council get money from. And it is a wonderful place, um, and it's quite a tourist area, and um, that is one way that um, it could be um, mitigated. Um, and one of the other things is um, um, there's a lot of unstable land um, out the Hokio area there um, that's kind of like being used as a bit of a waste dump. Um, it would be really nice to think that, you know, um, that area could get cleaned up and some green parks be established out there and 
one of the other nice things would be a shared pathway going out to that area that would sort of clean that place up and bring maybe a few tourist things. If you've got an adventure park out that way, it would be a great thing to do. Um, I would also like in support of the um, Ratepays Association to support a fiduciary duty of care policy. And um, I think um, I've made reference to the social impact report by Bronwyn Kerr in support of that. And um, one of the other things that I've talked about also is um, closed door meetings, which we've I've had some correspondence as the Secretary of the Ratepayers Association with you, Bernie, and um, so adding further to that, um, council meetings for all intents and purposes are open to the public and live stream, but when I've listened to them, I've heard the topics being raised and councillors are actually just voting a aye or no to something. So there's already been discussions which has not been presented to the public and what are those discussions about? Because obviously as the elected representatives you are discussing things that um, affect the community and is there a reason why they aren't open to the public? I don't know. And um, the other thing um, you made mention about the... Um, Development Contributions Workshop, which was opened up as a forum for the public. Um, now, my understanding is um, that was number two of three uh, forums that were, have been held, which the public were not invited to. So, again, there are things that are happening behind the scenes that we don't know about as members of the public. Um, I don't think I've got any more to say about that. Um, I'll just say about that one. And my last one. Um, oh, just on the rates rebate um, things um, and the Taraika development, it's highly likely the population will mainly be composed of superannuitants because they are the ones that um, they have capital to afford those properties, but um, they may be cash-strapped because they're living on superannuation only as their source of income. So to be able to raise rates is going to be highly questionable. Um, Superannuitants can't afford to keep on having rates uh, increased all the time. Um, And also thinking about um, what planning is council included in the long-term plan for the population rise in superannuitants if they come into that area. So again, it's increasing the level of superannuitants. We're not getting a diversity of population that's being encouraged to come into the um, area. Um, Oh, the court action. Council need to move away from the willingness to engage in environment court action. There seems to be um, an emphasis on, you know, if you are sitting around the table trying to have a discussion about stuff and um, eventually um, the decision is made by the council that uh, will solve it in the environment court. That's a really expensive way of solving problems. It just may mean that you need to have more and more dialogue with those community groups that are concerned about whatever is happening. Um, and I also support uh, a move to introduce capital value rating system um, and on a district-wide basis rather than a land value system. Um, I think that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've entered into our time for a break, but you're welcome to ask a question if you have any. Council. Thank you. Um, 
you, you made a really, um, I'll call it a bold statement early on that water supply is under threat. Can you quantify that statement or what that looks like or what we should be concerned about? about those buttons. My understanding is that you have a one day supply if there's an emergency, is that correct? Not correct? Drinking it's not drinking supply, that's storage. But that's drinking water, so in other words it is supply, is it not? It's it's storage, it's not supply. What the, what's the difference? Do you want a long answer? It's not the source of our water. Mm -hmm. Look, if I have a, a statement that our, our water supply is under threat, I'm thinking the river's going to stop flowing or the rain's going to stop coming down. It's not about how big our tank is that supplies that requirement of one day storage. Mm -hmm. Um, so you consider that the rivers are not a concern in terms of the pollution? I'm asking you to quantify your statement that the water supply is under threat. That's all I'm doing, because you made the statement. Oh, I think that nationally, and not just in this area, but nationally, uh, water is a, you know, which is why we have the three waters. Isn't, is that not correct? Because the water is... An issue. Well, I'd like to know why you're laughing. I'm trying to, it's quite definitive. Our water supply is under threat. I just want to quantify, please. I think nationally it's known that our water supply is under threat. I don't, no, think, this conversa I don't think this conversation is yes, going anywhere, so let's exactly. draw it to a close. Um, Councillor Browning. Thank you. Um, my question is around the Fox and Pool. Um, You've taken two options, uh, one to close the pool, uh, two to make it a seasonal pool, seasonal pool uh, by removing the roof. Uh, just can you just outline, expand a little bit on your reason, your reasoning around that, thanks? They were the two options that were presented by Council. Yeah, I'm just asking, just to expand on your reasoning for choosing those two options. Uh, cost. For, for the community. Cost. Um, I think my, if I recall, I haven't got the information in front of me right now, if I recall, um, there weren't that many people who actually used the pool? Is that my, is that correct? Oh, well, I guess it's how you quantify that. Um, the, the pool, so, the pool so is used, but it's whether it's used, not used enough because of the quality of what's being delivered. No, no, no. So it's, it's the cheaper op option in terms of if there's not, if there's insufficient use of the pool, why would you spend a whole lot of money rebuilding the pool as opposed to removing the roof and it, you keep the pool in the community and it becomes a seasonal option? Thank you. I promise I'll be reasonably quick. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, you mentioned schools and councils, so you're aware that we do have zero waste and virus schools in the district, and um, the, there are projects that happen, like Levin School did um, a project with only rain down the drain with council staff, made a video and it went viral, so that was quite a, an important um, part that they played. They're also participating in planting days across the district, including Tokamaru and the Fox and Rulu. Um, and basically they can only participate when they can because they have quite um, full-on programs as you can imagine from term one through to four so when they are able to participate in extra things um, they they do do that so I just and I don't wait to be invited by schools I invite myself um, do you, what about high schools High schools are a little trickier to get into, but I have um, some of the council staff have worked with the high schools in regards to recycling bins 
and some of the waste minimisation they have there. Um, I've only been to Horofina College. I haven't been to the other two yet. Thank you, Liani, for your continued interest in community affairs. We appreciate it, and thank you for your submissions. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you. Um, so, councillors, we will take a five-minute break and um, refresh.
Kiri, please come to the table. Thank you. Welcome, Kerry, and, and you've obviously taken uh, quite, a cons made quite a considerable effort to be here, so I appreciate that. I hope you um, um, can still um, talk to us, and uh, um, so I'll let you, uh, you've been here many times before, um, so I'll let you make your submission. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My submission on the plan covers two specific areas, smoke free and shade planning, and a request that you consider the health impact on the community in all the decisions that you'll be making through the long-term plan. Firstly, the long-term plan is an opportunity to ensure that the smoke free environment policy adopted in 2017 becomes a lived reality for the community. Let's reduce the harm caused by tobacco. I ask that you fund an implementation plan for the Smoke Free Environment Policy. Presently, and I do recognise the amazing work that went into the development of the Smoke Free Policy back in 2017, but the problem is, without an implementation plan, that is just a piece of paper or a file that's tucked away without any impact on the community. So presently, there appears to be no visible smoke-free signage in local parks, playgrounds and sports fields, all areas that are included in the smoke-free environment policy. The local smoking statistics of Horofenua being higher than the national average and the particularly concerning rates for Māori give compelling reasons as to why this needs to be a priority. These smoking rates represent the premature loss of queer and kaumatua, taking away the opportunity for cultural traditions, knowledge and histories to be passed on to younger generations and rob iwi and hapu of important and informed role models. These are the families, the parents, the potential community leaders, both present and future, raising their children, the next generation, all bearing the burden of smoking. The Government Smoke Free Action Plan 2025 is presently out for consultation. The plan builds on successful measures over the last decade and it has helped reduce smoking rates to 13% in New Zealand. But much more needs to be done to address the much higher smoking rates for Māori and Pacifica and the ongoing inequities. The plan, however, presently fails to acknowledge the role that local authorities have played in reducing the impact of smoking and use of public spaces, smoke-free outdoor environments and the environmental impact of cigarettes. Almost all councils have now adopted policies to promote smoke-free outdoor environments and smoke-free outdoor dining. Locally, this action has been well supported across our region and these have been effective at reducing the visibility and harm of smoking to our next generation. The remit regarding the smoke-free outdoor dining that Palmerston North City Council successfully led and was well supported by this council at the 2015 local government conference was an inspiring example of advocacy and leadership. However, local government New Zealand 
has still been asking for national legislation for smoke-free outdoor hospitality areas since 2015. So I ask that you add your voice. I ask that you petition central government to make our current local authority best practice outdoor policies a matter of law for all of New Zealand so everyone can benefit. Let's help achieve a smoke-free country by 2025 and call for legislation to designate all outdoor hospitality venues as smoke-free. The smoke-free plan measures impacting on council responsibility also include reducing the supply of tobacco in the community and the removal of filters from tobacco, a major pollutant in our waterways. The second issue that I'd like to focus on is that I noticed that the consultation process for the long-term plan seems to have attracted much interest in proposals for, for Foxton Pool, a splash pad, and the development of Waitiri Beach Domain and Playford Park. From a SunSmart point of view, I'd like to ask has shade assessment been factored into these proposals and other possible shade development for Hokio Reserve, Victoria Park, Morgan Crescent Reserve and Vincent Drive Reserve. Parks and playgrounds need to have shade if we're going to protect our children from the extreme levels of UV radiation experienced in the summertime. New Zealand rates of skin cancer are increasing and we have the highest mortality rate in the world for our New Zealand men. Yet we know that skin cancer is largely preventable with over 90% of all skin cancer being attributed to excess sun exposure. Finally, using a health and all policies approach ensures that council decision making addresses its impact on community health and wellbeing and creates a healthier, more livable community for all where we live, work and play. The benefits and costs of proposed development across our community need to be distributed equitably so that people living in high deprivation areas are not further disadvantaged. It's only by working together, using a health impact lens on your decision making, that we can hope to make a real difference to the burden caused by smoking and our overexposure to UV radiation in our community and today. So thank you for your time and your attention today. Thank you, Kerry. Any questions for Kerry? Kerry, thank you, and it's nice to see you again. Um, look, one of the things that I have, a ch uh, well, I'm charged with is as a council, we are... Um, aware of the need to provide smoke-free spaces and we have signs up <coughs> at our sporting venues and things like that but people still they ignore them and smoke what's what else can we do basically i think um part of an implementation plan would be looking at um how that the smoke-free policy could be strengthened um along with signage, which often is, that's one way of doing it, but also the education that needs to go, up, go alongside that, the um, st strong sort of commitment, social, you know, social encouraging that comes from people standing on the sidelines, being able to say, look, do you realise there's a sign over there that says smoke free? I'd rather, would you mind not smoking? particularly there's children here. Um, you know, at the moment, I think local governments are particularly um, hamstrung by the fact that their smoke-free policies are often based on, so on social encouragement. The action plan has been a way of being able to, say, give local councils a voice to say we actually want some legislation around this. So whether it will become legislation around smoke-free outdoor environments as well as 
um, hospital or outdoor hospitality as well. Um, look, thanks again, Kerry, for um, coming today. I know it's often, it's obviously been a bit of a struggle to get here and things, so we really appreciate the fact that you've done it. I think you've certainly highlighted for us that we do need to look uh, again at our policy and you've, your suggestion of the implementation plan uh, obviously needs to be looked at as well. So I thank you for highlighting those to us and I'm sure we will. Um, I'll make a commitment that we will do that. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I mean, for an implementation plan, I'd be really happy to be part of that, if that would help, yeah. um, and be in support of that. And any any support I can give, very happy to offer that. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Do you need some assistance there, or um... <laughs> no worries? Take your time. Kelvin, your turn at the table, thank you. Welcome, and um, thank you for coming. And Look forward to your submission. Thanks. Well, I like that. I'd just like to enlarge on the submission that I had written in and that I asked to speak to for the long-term plan. Um, I, of course, am chairperson for the Mandatory Estuary Trust at the moment, and, um, but I notice a number of persons here present, uh, more than um, uh, friendly to the Trust and have the same concepts and future uh, ambitions, I would think. But it's not really an ambitious situation, is it, that we're going to achieve so-and-so in such-and-such a time. But I'll just read out, and if I can enlarge on it, um, the Mandatory Estuary Ramsar site of Foxton Beach is of international su significance and an integral part of the Horofenua. Well, I'd like to drop the actual significance part, or an integral part, of the Horofenua and say that the trust itself and the, the estuary belongs to all those LTAs who are part of the catchment that flow down into the Manawatu. It just happens to be that the Horofenua is named as being the guardians of it and cops a lot of the comments and the flack and the concept that they're solely responsible along with the uh, Regional Council and the Department of Conservation. But in actual fact, as the others are contributors to it, I think that we need to go into some embarkation of making them some sort of a responsibility, not... Um, in a very tangible way, to say that everything that they contribute through the downward gravitational of the river is part of the estuary trust itself. And it's not only our responsibility, but theirs very much so, on the basis of recreational and significance of its habitat and its ecological system. Uh, for the two and three hours of the, uh, days of the week, one would be really taken back if they saw the, the amount of significance it has for recreation when they see everything honing in towards the beach and using the water area as a regional recreational area. But very, but I do feel that for the uh, Manawatu, 
uh, District Council, the Te Arua District Council, um, we're relying through the auspices of a confederation of the Department of Conservation and the uh, Regional Council to be the barkeepers or to be the guardians of the trust along with uh, Hona Whanua. And But the estuary itself belongs to everyone. Horizons Regional Council and Department of Conservation and there is a growing collaborative effort between them. The Manitou Estuary Trust would request HDC that they continue to work collaboratively with HRC and DOC and local volunteer groups in the government and care of the estuary. Now just before I came this afternoon, we checked it out and uh, I always had suspicions, but there are only four or five estuary trusts within the whole <coughs> circumference of New Zealand. Three above Auckland, one for the Wellington province, and also one down on the Heath coast. The other trust, which is really a lagoon trust or a, a sea trust, is right down in Fiordland. So the, the estuaries themselves have never really gained the national significance that they ought to have. And yet, if there's ever any converse about the river, it is just that the river and the estuary seems to be just tacked on to the end. But it really is a totally different environment, both ecologically and for the habitat, and for the part that it plays in the economics on a national basis as well. Uh, we might be surprised to know that our fisheries around the circumference of New Zealand is greater than the total significance around the total amount of the Australian coast. And even the tuna industry is reliant on, in the, in the Australian uh, uh, situation, is reliant on the tuna sports which come over to the west coast of the South Island and are intervened and are then taken over to uh, uh, Port Lincoln and they are raised there. And even a, an amount is paid to the New Zealand fisheries in accordance with the fish quota which has been targeted and taken away from the New Zealand shores. The other thing is that the amount that the estuaries play in the nursery of our foreshore and our seabed is that significant that we are virtually turning a blind eye. From the 50s onwards, there's been a lot of work done on the entomology of the estuaries, but it's never been taken into account either at, um, at, at regional status or in, or in our um, ability to even forge it in to our plans of being able to use it as a habitat and, and keep it forward. The other thing which comes to mind is that one of the stumbling blocks when Britain came out of the EEC was the actual fisheries um, come, uh, surrounding the British Isles and the significant part that they play to the total economics of the EEC. And ours are none less, but we give it scant regard. And at the moment, there, of all the plans that there are made, there's not even a, a, a photograph of the estuary itself and even of the uh, montages either at the International Airport in Palmerston North or any of the publications put out by the Regional Council or any of the publications, I think even the one from the Honofunua stops at just this side of the Furukina, and but although that is a tidal area. Now within the dune area at Foxton Beach there are plants growing unique to the New Zealand dune landscape and volunteers spend many hours querying for this dune garden. The Manitou Estuary Trust requests the Horofanua District Council assistance with signage <coughs> and education and assist the protection of this area as part of the estuarine ecosystem. Even as I look around this room here now, I can see persons who are volunteers and who are significant on the basis of the botanical basis of our estuary and our dune area. It is unique in as much is that it's not repeated inland, but it's not unique when you look at on the wider basis of around New Zealand. We all have an estuary, we all have a, um, a seashore base, but along the Swiss coast we have the dune areas. And the botanical systems that, that are there are unique, and they're unique to us. And we have volunteers within our, uh, our estuary trust who are ardent in the preservation of these. As a trust form for the protection of the Manitou estuary, we would request HDC make every endeavour to prevent wastewater or stormwater from entering into it. Well, it's the wastewater that we're really concerned about. 
Now, on a legal basis, the stormwater has an entry into our waterways and into our rivers. And so that comes under some sort of a guardianship as well. But the wastewater and the new PNCC, uh, one coming to the fore for licence for the PNCC, I hope comes under very much scrutiny from the uh, council down here at Horafinua. The last time it was sought for in 2003, I was even a person from the trust membership was not allowed even to address the, uh, the council on the protocol that one council didn't intervene conventionally on the basis of another council seeking licence or a licence or a consent from the regional council. Well, I would trust and hope that even personally and as a council, we very much show our interest. And that's why I've said whakatawa. It virtually means a person's ready to go and, and take the, uh, the front of any endeavour for that. The Manawatu Trust is having funding adequate to establish a viewing platform catering for group studies and providing a platform to assist with projects such as the New Zealand Bird Atlas. For this to come about, we need HDC to recognise our sincerity and resolve to bring this facility to fruition. While there is definitely a growing interest amongst the populace for the estuary itself. On the 24th, we have a busload coming down from only just from Fielding, over 50 persons involved. And as far as the uh, establishing a, a, a viewing platform, it would be to assist and facilitate the ability for people to come on a consigned basis and um, experience what the estuary is about with local travel. Now I know this is for the LTA and for the 10 year plan, but I'm hoping that many of these things become our conversation as such, just in the first years of the 10 year plan. Yeah, Kamuti, thank you very much. Thank you, Gavin. Um, so, Deputy Mayor, mate. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you, and uh, appreciate your submission, and it is a very special part of our district, you acknowledge that. So, from reading your submission, you have the money to build a platform, is that right? Yes. You just, what, what do you need from HDC? We need, we need HDC and the Department of Conservation to come to an agreement of who owns just a strip of land the size of that. Have they said that? Have they said that? Yeah. Oh, yes. And we also need the... Uh, the building logistics to go into it, but we have a, a plan made out. But the monies that we have were not a heritage, they were put forward to us by a person who is still living. And it's that sincere, we've been holding them for over 12 months now. We can pay for the actual viewing platform, but there's a stumbling block with the Department of Conservation to say who is going to keep up the repairs and maintenance later on. But we're intending to plan it in concrete, so we don't need the lawn snow, we don't need anything other than the facility and the piece of paper to carry on and get on with the job. Um, thank you, Carolyn, and I'm sure another will be taken with that. And, um, thing. and uh, Horizons have indicated to you as well, I assume, that they see huge potential in terms of developing the Ramsar site and, and protecting it, and um, uh, I know there is a good deal of collaboration between Horizons and this council in terms of that? This basically, sir, in all due respect, this is the only council or speaking forum uh, platform here that I can make my comments with in Horizon. The only two other um, platforms to be able to speak are on forums and they count for nothing when it comes to actually a vote. There's no voting rights or anything like that and even if the minutes are taken, they can be set aside and marginalised not like here, amongst other councils that we know. Thank you once again for your submission, and um, we will take note, for sure. Thanks very much. So, can I invite the Mavtec team to um, come forward? I th looks like a team. Oh, Jim. Oh. 
So it's Dimuth. Good afternoon, Jack Daniel. Um, thank you. I hope I'll make it just go on 10 seconds. Maybe 10 seconds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Detlef Klein. I'm the acting chair at uh, MAFTIC, the Museum of Audiovisual Technology uh, in Foxton. Uh, some of you know me from uh, uh, the last 16 years of uh, me um, uh, being engaged with this organization. Um, my own uh, background is I've run a little company in Palmerston North uh, called Manual to Museum Services. That's a heritage conservation um, business. Uh, we have uh, seven members uh, of the profession on our team. Uh, and for 16 years now, I've been engaged with Maltec, uh, a part time, uh, part of the time as a chair. Uh, and uh, Jim Harper on my right has been chair uh, since. Uh, and uh, I'm about to take over the chairmanship again. On my left is uh, Frank Stark, who has been engaged by MAFTEC uh, as a consultant. Frank Stark is uh, a former director of the Fang Lui Regional Museum, where he oversaw a major redevelopment and seismic strengthening. Uh, Frank Stark, uh, uh, main sort of uh, uh, background is as director uh, of the National Film Archive, Nautonga, um, which he was for 25 years. Uh, Frank has uh, enormous experience in the running of organizations such as uh, uh, Nautonga and also the Fang Lui Region Museum uh, and in the development of these buildings. Um, now Frank's been on board with Maltec uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a contractor uh, uh, for, uh, to help us with the development of uh, this Grand Vision uh, Developer Workshop E. Uh, the pictures uh, that you see on the screen are taken from a concept plan uh, for the redevelopment of Maltec. And I'm here today to not ask you directly for commitment of cash uh, into the long-term plan. I'm asking you, or rather inviting you on behalf of Maltec to form a partnership with Maltec, a, a long-term partnership that is enshrined in the long-term plan. Why do I ask this? I ask this because in order to realize this vision as laid out uh, by Workshop E, uh, you've also received the full document uh, as an appendix to the uh, written submission. Um, to realize this, this vision, we have to uh, garner support uh, and the, the best and most credible support in our situation is of course HDC. HDC is still the landlord of the building, the Coronation Hall. Um, the building um, does require seismic strengthening to some degree and some other building envelope work. Um, what we are asking is commit to a long-term partnership with MIFTEC, and it is that partnership uh, that would allow us to be the credible applicant uh, to the funders such as Lottery Grants Board, um, Eastern and Central Community Board, Ministry of Culture and Heritage, Creative New Zealand, uh, Provincial Growth Fund, if you like, uh, to go forward, uh, request the funding to set this project on the road, and uh, with a promised backing by HDC, it would give us the clout to actually do that. Now, we failed on three um, funding applications in the past 12 months, uh, two to lotteries uh, and one to uh, the Ministry of Culture and Heritage. Uh, and the, the, the main reason is really because we have no one to say, we will back this. Now, obviously, there are a lot of people competing for limited funds and um, uh, in the council's budget. Um, so I again say we're not here to say commit to X amount of dollars for this, but to commit to a partnership. We seek the funding, you become the backer, 
they uh, provide the collateral. And usually, as you probably know, um, like the New Zealand Lotteries Grants Board, um, you apply for a certain amount of money from them, they want a third of your own contributions. Now, as a volunteer on organization, um, we just can't come up with that kind of money. It's impossible. However, as some of you will know, we were uh, quite successful in 2010, 2011, uh, with council backing um, to achieve third party funding from up to uh, around about $500,000 for a pump redevelopment of the building. Um, and that was a fantastic project. Um, and it rode on the back of the council uh, carrying out about $350,000 worth of building maintenance works, including seismic strengthening. So this is the kind of partnership that we're hoping um, to see in the long-term plan. Uh, Mavtex being an organization that's proven itself resilient in over 30 years, it's a purely volunteer-run organization. Uh, it's had lots of hurdles to overcome in our time. Uh, we've had uh, uh, ups and downs. A big up was the 2010-2011 redevelopment. Um, and since then, of course, there's been this, um, this threat of the building being sold off. Our question, of course, to council is, what will happen to the building if there's no tenant in the building? What other purpose is this building good for? Now, the building's been a theater and a cinema for, um, well, gosh, almost 100 years now since it was built in 1926. And it continues in that same tradition as a community focus, as a cinema, uh, and as a showcase for um, what is in the museum today. Uh, this collection of what is considered one of national significance. Um, so here's a challenge. I'd like to uh, also reassure you that the people on the board uh, are not on the board because this is a hobby for them. Um, I've got a lot of things uh, on my plate as a, a running small business. Um, Kathy McCartney was on the board, is a very busy person, also running her own business. You know her from her time as consultant for TANS. Jim Harper is a very busy man, even though he's retired. And he's a, he's a local um, well-known personality, as you know. Um, Frank is very busy. Um, we have uh, people on the board um, that have been there for a long time, like, the, like David Roach and Francis Roach. Uh, they're committed uh, to the community of Foxton and uh, the greater region of uh, uh, Horofenua. They're not on there because they've got nothing better to do. Um, we're all on there because we're fully committed and we see this vision. Uh, and uh, you see it as well now, hopefully. Uh, and we'd uh, really like to invite you to come on board with this. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, or James. Two really quick questions, please. Um, do you keep uh, a track of uh, visitor numbers? Like, would you be able to tell us how many visitors you have across a 12-month so period? On um, what we do, I can uh, say that this last year with the COVID uh, lockdown restrictions and a lot of our volunteers being elderly people, uh, not only will we closed uh, during the mandated lockdown periods, but also for um, extended periods of time because uh, as elderly uh, volunteers, uh, we did not want to subject them to any, any, any extra risk. Um, so attendance has been very down. Um, we are limited in how much we can open. We can only open for uh, a few hours uh, on Saturday and a few hours on, su on Sunday on a regular basis, and that's been a very regular uh, feature of Mavtech because we're all volunteers. We don't have any paid staff. We'd like to open all week, but it's impossible to do with volunteers only. Now, there's no reason to believe why... Um, uh, the, the visitors currently uh, at the windmill and the tans uh, shouldn't be coming to a life take as well. They can, tans and uh, the windmill have large numbers of visitors because they have uh, full-time employees keeping the place open. Um, and so they're open seven days a week. We want to be that too, but we can't do it without significant external support. 
Um, on that note, also, Tenz and Titakere were once a, a dream, as you, as you might remember. Uh, almost an impossible seeming dream, particularly for Tenz. Look at what is now. Um, visitor numbers uh, to the Horofinua are rising constantly. They will only get more, including residents, uh, with the completion of the highways um, to, to the Vin and beyond. So to answer your question more, uh, more directly, uh, how many visitors? Um, usually about three to 5,000 people a year. Um, now, last year was a fraction of that. Uh, most of visitors come through group visits. So we get like the car, uh, vintage car clubs or uh, uh, probus and rebus groups um, uh, and so forth. They make bookings during the week. Uh, people like Jim uh, accommodate them. So there'll be groups of visitors, and we show them movies uh, and tell them a little bit about the history of the Horofenua and also about the, 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 the whole cinema broadcasting experience. Well, it's very tiny, last, very quick. Um, do, you have, do you have an idea about the total project costs? Do you have a ballpark? No, uh, I don't. We haven't costed that out. We've got the vision, yeah. and it's the vision that leads us. Thank you, gentlemen. I uh, really appreciate you being here. Um, we um, accept the challenge. Oh, sorry, Mitchell. Sorry, we were, we were, I'm trying to catch up a little bit of time for some of the others here, but yeah. It's okay. Well, I just want to clarify, thank you. So you would like us to come in as a, as a partner, and what that would really look like for us, or mean for us, is, is about a third of the cost of funds that you need to apply for, Usually that's that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Would Frank like to comment on that because Frank has quite a few, quite a bit of experience with exactly this. There are there are two fundamental things that external funders at a national level look for, um, and they are community support, however that can be quantified, uh, and a financial stake. What they don't like, obviously, is becoming 100% investors in projects which end up drifting away because there's no community basis for them. And the great majority of, of projects on this kind of scale, with big collections, are put forward by public, um, sorry, local authority owned organisations, museums, particularly galleries and so on. So it's a particular struggle for uh, independent organisations to fit into that paradigm. And what uh, this project really needs is both of those things. It needs a clear support statement uh, and buy-in from the HDC, which may be of zero cost, but still is enough to demonstrate the first one of those two needs. And the other one is the, um, the financial contribution. In this case, the Horrifying District Council is the owner of the building. Um, and so a lot of what uh, will count in the eyes of funders as financial support could also just simply be seen on your side of the equation as normal ongoing maintenance and repairs on a building which you already own. And that can be totally legitimately credited into the equation as an investment, if the timing is suitably managed, shall we say. If you do the two things integrated way, then the kind of work that in many cases the council would have scheduled somewhere on its r &M, uh, list for doing to one of its assets can be credited as investment in a development project. As we were, thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate the submission and the challenge that you've laid to us. Thank you all. Is he? Sorry? Yes. So the Fox and Community Board is next.
Welcome, Doug. Welcome, Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Councillors. Right, we're here on behalf of the Poxton Community Board. And if you want to catch up a little bit of time, we will keep going. Right. First, we're going to talk about economic development. Destin the board supports the development of the destination management strategy and encourages council to invest and identify the mechanisms to drive it. We need to develop a clear identity for Foxton and Foxton Beach, which are distinct but complementary. Foxton as a commercial centre and Foxton Beach as a recreational hub. The development of a Foxton Town Centre strategy could be incorporated to draw tourists into the town centre and promote the unique, the unique attractions Foxton has to offer. I'm sorry, I'll get more come I did tell the lady that I know what to do. <laughs> right, oh, Fox and Futures. The reopening of the loop. We want to congratulate Council and on their efforts and trying to secure funding. We would like Council to uh, continue to and support the applications and implement the plan of the Fox and um, Reopening by start by sort. The board support council with the development and implementation of an economic development plan. This should include the Foxton Township and the wider area. The board is keen to explore opportunities to play a greater supporting role in any of these initiatives. Redevelopment, Foxton War Memorial Hall. The board supports the redevelopment of the Moorwell Hall and council encourage the council to support the proposal presented to the board by the Interment Society on the 22nd of March to return the War Memorial Hall to Foxton community ownership through the sale or gifting to the base incorporated society. Heritage and Arts. The board requests continued support for the ongoing development of Mab Tech, including the work around the development plan and support the preparation of a business plan. The board would like to see the re-establishment of the Heritage Fund, recognising Foxton as the heritage capital of the district and, sub and subject to a reconsideration of the criteria. Oh, growth plan. The board supports and encourages council proceed with the Fox and Beach and Downman Lean with immediate focus on the Kilmister block for development. The board would like to ensure that adequate supply of land for residential housing and actual, and actual hazards are appropriately considered and substantially, substantially is incorporated in the future plan. Right, now, Foxton Pool. The board supports option one, an all-round multi-purpose experience for the aquatic centre not just a rebuild of the building. It is the belief of the board that the council should take a positive and proactive approach in considering what is needed to support and sustain community facilities in response to the growth, the district growth that has currently been seen and predicted to happen over the next 20 years. This is from the council's recent adoption of the 75, 95% percentile. The alternative is an ad hoc planning that will make it difficult to create positive outcomes and lack of a suitable facility for our growing community in the aquatic space in Foxton and across the district. The existing pool is an example of what happens when planning for the future is not considered. An aquatic centre that is not fit for purpose within 12 years of construction. As a result, it is poorly attended and unpleasant to use. The board urged council to make a decision that reflects on the needs of the community and the wider district for both now and the future. All right, Holden Reserve. The board would like to see sufficient funding allocated to Holden Reserve development in according with the concept plan. Without the funding from central government, the board identifies road safety improvements as its first priority. The board would like to see the Funding allocated to the Holden Reserve Road Safety Improvements to be undertaken in the first year of the LTP. Further, priority be, is to dedicate the dedicated of 70, 700000 from the Fox and Beach Reserve Investment Fund into stormwater mitigation coupled with beautification 
such as boardwalks, wetlands, and ecological improvements. The board requests council to allocate sufficient funding in the first three years of LTP to engage in large estate development across the reserve over substantial years, including the program and recreational area. Everybody look on your face there, Mr. Wandam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all right. I thought you'd be laughing at what we were saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Darbert Reserve. The board support council investigating opportunities for commercial development of Darbert Street Reserve. We urge Council to progress with this development of the residential lots along Hall Place. Alright. Environmental enhancement. The Board encouraged continued collaboration between key partners to lead the development of the joint funding and overarching management plan of the Manitou Estuary and surrounding dune fields. The Board supports increased stewardship and statutory part of my Statutory partners of this international recognised Rampart site and surrounding environment urge Council to lead this work. The Board also sees the partnership with local environment focus groups for stakeholders such as the Fox and Beach Progressive Association, Manitou Estuary Trust Team, IWI, is vital to ensure the ongoing and coordinated collaboration between the important work to achieve the best outcome for the sensitive and highly valued environment. CCTV. The board support and encourages CCTV establishment in Foxton Town Centre and request consideration to be given for an allocation of funding for this project. CCTV in the town centre in the main street is a good investment which will help curb unsavoury behaviour and crime as well as providing health and safety to the citizens using the streets. It will offer support to the local police who are only in Foxton a few hours each day. Uh, Foxton Water Tower Lighting and Lighting Project. Recognising the icon nature of the water tower for locals and visitors alike, the board recommends council identify the income stream from the telecommunication rental as a source of funding and allocate additional funding for the maintenance as required. Maintenance costs part sought from telecommunication rental would reduce the cost of council allocation. Fox and Beach Surf Club Promenade Enhancement. The board supports, the board are supportive of the Fox and Beach Surf Club Promenade Enhancement work and request for funding to be allocated to complete the required work. The board recommends that the Fox and Beach free old account be that source of funding. The board recognises the completion of the promenade and enhancement work and utilisation with the surf club improvement which provide support to predicted growth and provide for future generations. Right, Mr Mayor, thank you. We rushed that through. It sounded like we had it recited. Now we will get an answer any questions from Council. And I'll find out when it's up in time for you. Um, maybe I could ask the first question. You've asked for a, a number of different um, funding allocations in that submission. Do you have any idea how much extra we're going to have to add to our long-term plan to incorporate them all? No, we have no idea. Holden Reserve, we have 700000 already for the site. Um, at the workshop, we were told that there was funding in the safety and road improvement. We will be eligible for state money from transit for safety improvement, and that is our priority. We've developed a very unique recreational area for kids, but we have a hazard of the road going through the middle of it. And the board sees that as the main priority for the road. Until the officers come back with some what it's going to cost, we have no idea. But the... Um the last one about the Foxton Promenade Enhancement, that's the sea wall that keeps on um, filling up the sand all the time. We've already talked about that coming from um, the freeholding fund. Councillor Allen. Yes, so speaking of a freeholding account, um, 
and we've asked other people as to how does the board as a group feel about some about funding from the freeholding account being allocated to option one, the swimming pool. If I can answer that, you know, the, the chairman. I've rung around the board members, they sort of support it in principle. Subject that it goes to the beach um, as part of the you know, consent from the beach people. Um, yes, but the board, from all of my ring around the board, are in support of it in principle. Thank you. And um, um, supplementary, um, just Councillor Jennings did address the issue of a targeted rate to, to cover the extra, maybe the help supplement the costs uh, of the swimming pool option one. Does the board have a view on that? No, we haven't actually discussed the uh, target rate, the separate rate. My initial response to that question would be, um, in six to nine years maybe, we will be looking to help pay for 30 to whatever it is, million, um, for the wind pool. So I see a share around cost is going to, what happens now is going to happen to us in the future as well. Uh, following on from the Mayor's point about um, you bring a list, I um, wondered if of that list, if I could just pick maybe four out, being um, the pool, Holborn Reserve, um, Mav Tech and the Memorial Hall, so those four, could you, for, for me or for other councillors, get prioritise in numbers one to four, which you would prefer one, two, three, four, of those four? I think as far as the community goes, and there was the biggest cost is the swimming pool. I'd see it number one. The Memorial Hall is, when I come back to you with a presentation, there's no cost to council. So, don't see that as an um, issue. What was the other one you wanted? MAPTEC. We are supporting MAPTEC um, because what they're doing, and they haven't actually asked council for money, because I've heard this before, they were looking for their support, but there may be money involved somewhere along the line, I would presume, but you know, I have no idea of a specific amount. We are in current supporting what they are trying to do. And the other one is road safety in Holman Reserve. Um, would expect that road safety improvement to come out of the roading budget, which is normal, and that would be subsidised. I'll take it at the 50-50. I think it's better than that at the moment, we are indicated from uh, transit under road safety improvements. Uh, so, just to clarify, we heard from that tech and it could be a third of the funding they require, so it's not no money. And then um, the other project was, um, you said there was no money for the hall, but we're all aware of the earthquake strengthening required and the um, some of the operational or maintenance funding you want for six years. Um, so that's not not wanting money. And then um, the Holborn Reserve is, well, the presentation at least is quite a yeah. grand one, um, but you're only speaking about a portion of it. So I just need to understand what your absolute... Yeah. Priority is. Yep. Okay, we um, the presentation that we, as I said, to do with MapTech, we are supporting MapTech. We do not have the dollars or what they are, and we just, we're, the board has supported MapTech all the way along, right from the start when it was the first museum, and it's always been supported as a tourist attraction into Foxton. The Holden Reserve is a master plan put forward by officers and the consultants. We were hoping, along with officers, that we were going to get some funding from central government, but that hadn't come to fruition. The 700000 that 
or mentioned is out of the um, freehold fund. There was a million dollars put aside for development of the reserves at the beach. We spent something like 300000 and that's gone into the skateboard park, or the, a pump track, I suppose, for a better word. Um, there's officers tell us that there's about 700000 left, and that's what we will be using as a second stage of the thing. We want to stage it. It was great and vicious plan in the $9 million, but without, we're not seeking $9 million or anywhere, some kind of sum like that, or anything like that. I wouldn't spend $9 million on a park. I wouldn't endorse it as a, as a board member. If the government come up with the money, then I'd take it and we'll have the precious park in the country. Simple as that. A gold plate right, is that. Well, uh, answer the question. Thank you um, to you both, and I uh, appreciate the submission. Um, as you've heard, there's obviously quite a lot of interest in a lot of the topics you've uh, raised, and obviously we'll deliberate accordingly. Thank you. I just sort of want to mention um, about the road safety. Um, it's, it's my, my bandwagon thing. It's a complete health and safety one. It needs to be done in the year one of the plan. People have rung us up. People have come to my door continually about the danger, the speed of the cars that go down, down that particular part of the road. And when it was going to, oh, wait a few months while we do the big park thing, that's not going to happen. We need to do it now. We need to do it before someone is killed. Duly noted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will sit in and wait for the next <laughs> next round. So we're now talking about the Fox and War uh, Memorial Hall Interim Committee. David and Nola, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. It's quite an extensive document that we've submitted to Council. So between Noel and I, we will um, touch on the headings. Noel will touch on anything that relates back into the long-term plan. And then without having to read it all out to you, you're bound to read it, um, we'll get straight into answering questions and that, because I'll certainly use up my 10 minutes answering all the questions or questions that Council has had. Much more productive, Steve. Thank you. Well done. Right, oh. You've read the start, the context, why we want to do it. The challenges from HDC. The benefits of the proposal. And how we're going to go about it. All documented from the budget, the constitution, right through the budget, the time frame and the petitions, the submissions, and the support for the project. We'd like to point out that the second... Oh. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. The, the signatures obtained were done in three days. This, and we asked, were asked to do social media. We didn't have time. There is extremely strong support that the Memorial Hall in Fox and the War Memorial Hall gets returned to the um, residents of Foxton and Foxton Beach. So we're open, we're open to Mr. Mayor for questions, because that would be far more. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, questions? Councillor Jennings. Um, so my question relates to, um, I guess, the worst case scenario. So 10 years ahead, so say the council supports the proposal. 10 years ahead, um, you're, um, you don't have the money that you need to operate it on a yearly basis and you, you, you're in a situation where you can't continue. So my question is, what, what happens then? I see in the, um, in the draft... Um, Constitution for the uh, for the trust um, that there would obviously be a liquidation process that's proposed, but uh, again, and, and the and the position under that constitution is at the moment is that those funds would be distributed um, to a non not for profit organisation within Foxton. But my question is around a building that needs considerable spend on it to earthquake strengthen it. It's got limited 
uh, a potential in its current form. So, are you able to just talk me through what 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 is the sort of the, the that you're planning for that worst case scenario? Thank you, Wolf Councillor. Well, first of all, let's deal with limited potential because the building has limited potential for the council currently under council standards of who to enter a building under earthquake strengthening. The building is not going to fall down tomorrow. Um, so to deal with that, there is a plan in the scope of works to apply. As an incorporated society and to become a registered charity, anything that happens to that society, the assets must be distributed to another not-for-profit. That is the given. So that is the if you like, the benefit of it being an incorporated charity is that another group in Foxton could take it over. But we do not believe on the figures we've provided, particularly income-wise, they're majorly understated for what even the budget service is prepared to pay in rent for it not to be profitable. Hope that answers it. Thank you. So I may have missed something here. So did you just say that you didn't feel like you needed to bring it up to earthquake standard because you weren't the council? No, what I'm saying is that the council currently are not promoting its use because it doesn't meet council standard, which is quite a valid statement to make. But that wouldn't go for all the buildings in Foxton currently, nor all the buildings in Levin currently. Definitely under the scope of works in the submission, there is the, the, not only the belief, but the intent, most um, certainly, to get it up to a standard that the committee that's running it will decide the level of that standard. That may or may not be council standard, because I can't, make that decision on behalf of a group in the future. Does that answer? Right. Can I add to that? It isn't our plan to earthquake strengthen it. That is, that's in the plan here. That's right. year three. Right. And that's, that's what we will be striving for because we see it that with the earthquake strengthening, the upgrading of the premises, and that reflects on the usage, and we believe it will have more using, which is reflected in the income. And, and I guess um, as a public building, council would need it to be brought up to a certain standard. There's a certain date, isn't there, that, 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 that buildings that have public use have to be brought up to a certain standard. So it's OK, and, and you can actually manage to do that within your finances. OK. The advantage of being an incorporated society is the access to grants, not necessarily that council can access. I mean, you guys are faced with huge debts and trying to find money. We're trying to find a way to find a way to keep a valued um, asset in the community and in community hands that actually adds to what the council and the whole district provides as, as a level of service to its residents. I just add to that. It's always been my belief that um, while council can't get funds from lotteries or Eastern, Eastern and Central for upgrading the earthquake strengthening, we're a charitable trust can. We can apply for it. And that's been the driving force behind um, separating them from council, for better word, and we can look for the money where we're not a burden on the right path. We will look for the money. That's our job. Yes, to propose. Um, like Councillor Mitchell asked the question of clarification, I've got one um, around you're mentioning the, the financial forecasting you have in your submission and then you named budget services as a tenant and the, the price they were willing to pay. Um, yet we heard from budget services own submission that they want to be the new owner or trust. So I'm confused. Are they coming in as a tenant or are they going to be the, what you're proposing to be? Um, okay. uh, the budget service want to be a tenant, but until this group is 
made up and incorporated, you can't put the cart before the horse. Um, the, the budget service has to pay rent wherever they are. They originally had no rent to pay in the old library in Foxton. They were then faced with um, going into Te Awanui Strum, which wasn't suitable for privacy for their own people. Um, so they're currently now tucked away in somewhere that doesn't meet health and safety. Having said that, they've invested, investigated a number of options for renting places around Foxton, and so I know they're looking at paying rent, any, and it says in their submission they would pay rent towards the running of the community hall, um, or the War Memorial Hall, but they don't say how much, and they don't say who's actually going to do the running. They actually say in their submission they want to be the owners which is a little bit different. Um, we're committing to actually own and run with, with the budget, which has got a, as a social community hub in the community, the budget service might be one of several tenants in the building. The idea being that currently Foxton does not have a place for wraparound services, apart from Te Aora, for mental health addiction, for drug addiction, for even antenatal care and things like that. Um, and that's why we believe we supplement our Winnery Strum. We don't, we're not in competition with it. We don't believe that you can hold a dance class upstairs in Tiao Winnery Strum um, without shaking the building down. Um, and those sorts of facilities need to be available, the same for weddings, things like this. So we believe there actually is a huge demand at a much lower price. Um, for people to use. Yeah. Just to answer your question, do you see the budget service as a tenant or an owner? At this stage, they will be a tenant, not the owner. That's the drive behind it. This is our submission that we presented to Council, and on the strength of that, we would like Council to make the decision. It's not who would the... I have to say I was disappointed with Mr. John Gurley and his suggestion. I've taken him through the hall. We've looked at how he can accommodate the three rooms on the end. It's always been my vision, and I've taken it from officers that you had to think outside the square. And my first thought was um, professional people to hire the officers, and we get another income, something you know, to support the rental. The budget service came along and they were keen. We went and had a look at how we could make it work. And at this stage, they are, we can see the benefits of the, they are tenant already there. We can get in. Um, it was part of a social service on that end of the building. And we have the hall as the, we retain as a hall. So they can be separated. We've looked at that. But in my view, he will be a tenant, not an owner. That help? Yeah, that, thank you. I just wanted to understand whether there was another budget services or was the same one who presented to us claiming to be the, the most appropriate as they were already an incorporated society, not a new one trying to set up. That was all. And um, agree wraparound services or a hub for that sort of thing is, is good. Councillor K. Simmons. I'm going to say no. Um, just as a, a, a thought, have you, either of you been to Te Whare Mahana Community Hub at the back of the RSA that's done exactly what you're talking about? Um, you mentioned the, the budget service in Foxton having to have soundproof rooms. We've moved from a soundproof room within budget service to Te Whare Mahana and while they're not soundproof, there is one room available for that. And we're managing very well with two offices there. So um, I suggest you go and have a look and maybe have a chat to the other users of that community hub that are using it. I think you'll find a lot of the information they can share with you very helpful. Thank you. That, that information would be most important to give to Mr Gurley. Um, just for him, for looking for their premise need is quite urgent. Um, but, yeah and they don't have a visibility in Foxton at the moment, this new group that you've been by. So I'm really excited to hear about that and hear what they've got to offer. Put my button again. I should just, think so. Just, um, sorry, just one more. Um, 
the Winds office in Foxton, you could, they can have a hot desk there. We've had one here in Levin. I'm sure that the Winds office would be able to help them there as well. He can ring me anyway, just saying. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Nola. Um, you've set us a bit of a challenge, and um, it will be a big part of the deliberations. Everything's a challenge, David. Lots of challenges. Thank you. Only half an hour, like. Welcome, Andrew. Sorry? Yeah, the technology. Hello, Liz. Welcome. I'm on and Andrew, this is Liz, who's here to speak on behalf of our submission for the uh, new surf club building and primarily around funding for that building, um, sort of our last, what we think is our last hurdle anyway. Um, I just wanted to sort of start off and say, you know, firstly thanks, well, this has been a project we've been working on for about 30, since 2008, I think. Um, we met out at the beach with a previous mayor who was a previous clubby and he said, what about, why don't you put the club out there sort of thing, so that really sort of crystallised our vision where we wanted to put the club, um, and through our submission you'll sort of see where that is, um, and I guess, yeah, we've worked with sort of councillors and officers over that period of time, particularly through the designation and accretion process, which were, yeah, <laughs> enduring, <laughs> um, but, you know, we're, we're incredibly pleased and thankful that we've got through those processes. Um, Yeah, I think if we'd known it was going to take that long, we might have made a different decision then. But I think now, you know, 13 years later, the beach just keeps on accreting, and we're sort of, you know, we're, we're happy we made that decision, and also um, keen to get on, get the building, or the, you know, us in the community are keen to get the building built. So I'll hand over to Liz. Okay. Um, I just thought before we start, I'll just give you an overview of where we are at the club, so um, what we call our growing wave. Uh, as of this season to Spain, we have 200 members, 50 lifeguards, 100 nippers, which we call the Junior Surf Programme, 50 plus family, friends and supporters. We have over 1,800 patrol hours each season, 1,000 plus hours of lifeguard training and development, and 1,000 hours of governance, management, organisation, coaching and instructing. And this is a picture obviously of some of our kids from this season. So the club is in a good place at the moment. Um, I, I guess looking at, at the future, and that's where we really want to focus, um, as Liz pointed out, the club is, is in, quite a, in a growing way, um, quite in a very strong position. Um, but I think you know, they're, they're, there's a rising sort of demand and also risk um, on the beach. You know, we're expecting significant population growth um, over the next um, 10 or so years. Um, we've also, there's about 23 kilometres of beach, I think, between Ohau and Manawatu River, so there's a long coastal area to look after. Um, and also there's sort of an increasing number of sort of beach access. Um, at, yeah, even, you know, Ohau is looking, or there's a pathway down there. Um, that, you know, people are getting access to now. So, you know, I guess the, the club and also the, the council have a sort of responsibility for providing access to provide... Um, you know, a, a safe and safe place to be able to um, recreate and also and swim on the swim on the sea and also provide services to that. 
Um, I mean, just to, just to also support that sort of rising demand and just, I guess, the risk um, surf, is, is in the submission. Surf Life Saving recently sort of published some stats that over the, in the last decade, 10, they sort of, it was 10,000 rescues, which is basically 10,000 lives saved. That's throughout New Zealand. Um, you know, when you sort of first look at the number, you go, surely that can't be right. Um, we did a few quick sums at our beach. You know, we did eight rescues this this summer over a sort of three year period. Um, it's not really nice detail to look at, but if you look at the sort of the road toll in our area over that similar period, it's like one or two or something like that. So, you know, the the risk at the beach is quite significant, and if the club wasn't there, um, you know, potentially some of those lives could have been lost, which would have been um, you know, pretty tragic. So um, that, that's sort of the demand and the risk, you know, the rising risk as, as the region grows. Um, also, lifeguarding services, with that, with that increasing demand, um, increasing demand on volunteers. So, you know, we've probably about a thousand years, thousand hours straight into the patrol on the beach over that period of time. Um, on top of that, the, you know, the lifeguards are doing training development. We provide sort of community education programs, which including, which Liz will talk about, with junior surf, um, you know, members involved in the emergency call-out squads, um, SARS, so search and rescue, um, and we also provide sort of water safety events to the district as well. So we've recently done some, some up in Fox and up the, uh, off the loop, where events have been running there. Um, so, and, and also is particularly for us with that very long coastline, um, I think it's going to be increasing expectation that clubs and service, you know, lifeguards, Organisations provide a, a full service across that sort of, you know, it might not be patrols <laughs> in Ohio and up near the river, but, um, you know, certainly being able to uh, respond to issues or incidents in those areas. Um, you know, also signage like at Ohio, you know, giving people, um, providing signage and instruction on how to use the beach and things like that if they're there. Um, I'll hand over to Lizzie. Um, and just with this junior surf program, so this season alone we had 100 kids, they age from 6 to 13. They are our future lifeguards, so that's our pool of lifeguards we were getting them from. And this season we had 10 juniors move from juniors through to lifeguards. So that's a, the lifeguard, this junior surf program is really important for growth. Um, but we're limited in growth due to the current state of our building. So um, this season was the first time I've actually capped the numbers, we weren't able to take any more families on, um, and given our primary goal for junior surf is teaching kids how to be safe in our waters, um, it was quite disappointing to turn families away from teaching them and making them comfortable on the beach. Um, so I'm just going to the picture. Uh, so uh, obviously picture up here is showing the original building worked back in 1953, um, and then our current building, so this was taken only a, a week ago, so that is the current state of the building. Um, it's structurally unsound, um, you can actually see a dip in the roof, there's a whole lot more going on inside the building. Um, for us to continue using this building, it presents a major health and safety risk. Um, the current facility is making it increasingly more difficult to safeguard children and young people in our club, so um, Sport New Zealand last year had a big push on safe and well-being of children and they implemented a policy called Safe Sport for Children. And then New Zealand Surf Life Saving on top of that went, well, okay, we need to implement some policies to safeguard the children within the surf club. Um, we adopted that policy, but we weren't 100% able to implement it given the state of the building and the location. So what I mean by that is when we have 100 kids that are heading down to the beach, once they disappear over the sand dunes, we can't see them from the building. And then vice versa, when they're coming back up from the beach, they have to go back, as you can see in the bottom photo, quite a distance back from the beach, and then they go through the car park. And if we're still down on the beach, we can't see where they're going or where they're at. Um, and then on top of that is the problem inside the building. Um, the shower facilities just aren't appropriate for kids, and um, especially now kids and adults, and not able to share that same space. Um, and this season, we had lifeguards that were out on patrol all day, 
couldn't come up for a hot shower because we still had juniors up in the surf club and so they just had to go home. So we're not actually providing the right services for our lifeguards. We're volunteering their time to safeguard our beach. Um, on top of that, the building uh, is we have the opportunity to have carnivals at the beach, which obviously showcases our region and how one of our beaches. Um, we're unable to do that as well because when we have carnivals, we're looking at at least two to 300 kids coming from out of the region to compete on the beach. So there's lots of opportunities that we aren't able to fulfil in the surf club. Uh, this is a view, sorry, it's not overly clear on the light, but it's on the left-hand side. It's our current view from our tower in that building. Um, and this was at a very low tide, so you still can't see the beach from the building. And then on the right is the view from our <coughs> proposed site at a low tide where we can see the beach. Sorry, um, that was actually that is actually still the current building, but the sands come up here, um, here. So um, <laughs> yeah, so the one on the left hand side is actually the current building, just half of it's buried. Um, so just just jump into the proposed site. Um, we've effectively what we're proposing to do is move out seaward and sort of south of the current surf club location. Um, that's so we can, most of our patrols are sort of south, we want to move away or move away from the entrance so people can access the, access the beach, you know, safely in their vehicles and, or by foot um, without sort of running straight into a patrol. Um, so that's sort of the reason for the location. Um, it was part of the designation process back in 2016, um, some constraints around, so we were looking at it building up to sort of 500 square metres, um, can be up to up to well, up to two stories. Um, primarily use again, the primary use of the building again sort of restricted by through the designation process is primarily for lifeguard services, um, not commercial activity, um, but also you know what does provide for community use and groups and things like that. Um, also hoping that we can design the building to be able to operate the lifeguard service and other activities at the same time, whereas the current club is just not the space to, space to do that. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the um, current facility. Um, we just thought I'd share, share with you a few, few <laughs> give you a flavour of what's, what's happening around the place. <laughs> um, it's all in New Zealand, so... Uh, um, <laughs> So we've got um, so Lyle Bay Surf Club in Wellington, obviously. Um, Spencer Park's a new facility, a new club, well, a new building in a club out in Christchurch, Kaikokariki, which is um, I mean, their built building just about to be washed away. Um, so that's a proposed building they've got to sort of go step. They've got the opposite to us. They're going back behind the dunes into, into Q2 Park. Um, Murawai Surf Club up in. Uh, Auckland on the west coast and some East Surf Club. So I guess that's just an example of what's what's happening. I guess they're um, aspirational <laughs> um, idea of, of what, what clubs are doing um, and what modern surf club facilities look like. Um, this one explains itself really but only shows the ownership um, we would like to recommend the current model of ownership is maintained which is obviously the council owning the club and we lease the building as we do now um, obviously uh, our main function is surf life saving and patrolling and not about managing buildings um, sorry in terms of, of funding um, this well, has been a discussion we've had with council for a little while um, so we're sort of Looking at the council being a cornerstone funder and and, un, and possibly underwriting the project as well, um, that, that provides. I mean, there's a, there's, there's other sort of funding funding groups available, um, and the council that sort of cornerstone council funding provides. You know, I guess the reassurance um, 
and it's also credibility to the project for other funders to come on board um, you know, with the knowledge that they, if they put their money in or contribute to that or commit to that project, it's going to happen. Um, I guess some of the other funding sources, the club has been sort of screwing away money for the last 20 or so years. So we've got sort of somewhere between 150000 to $200,000 that we've sort of put away, committed to the new building. Um, central government, as you're mostly aware, have created a fund for capital um, capital expenditure on buildings. And as you know, that Fox and Surf Club recently secured, all three of you guys secured $800,000 for their refurbishment. Um, and again, I've spoken to the CEO of Surf Life Save Save New Zealand, who's who's sort of confirmed that the you know the council um, cornerstone funding side of things is it would provide a lot of credibility to their decision making. Um, we're about to put in a in the next month or so put our application in for that um, funding and working with council officers to do that. Um, there's obviously community grant organisations which have up until now been a sort of main source of funding for clubs as well. Um, and again, sort of individuals, um, businesses and, and estates, which is where some of our money has come from um, and put away for, for this sort of purpose. Um, Timing-wise, um, I understand that in the, in the long-term plan, the funding sort of penciled in around sort of year two and year three, uh, year three and four, I think, um, where we're sort of keen to bring that as forward, um, as forward as much as we can. We don't sort of see the major barriers, you know, the oppression claims out of the way, designations out of the way. Um, so other than sort of funding um, and the physical construction, there's not sort of major barriers to getting underway. So we're sort of, we are asking that, that that funding can be brought forward um, and that the council can provide, you know, direction to the officers to sort of get in and support the, support the club straight away. Um, and, you know, optimistically, we were sort of thinking of a 2022-2023 um, sort of finish date, but that's a little bit contradicting what, <laughs> what's sort of being said at the moment, but uh, in terms of, you know, ability for the council to do that. Um, I guess just over looking at key milestones, sort of going back, and also sort of key points in this, 2010, there's a couple of reports down, both of which recommended... Um, in 2011, that the pavilion area of the building should be demolished. Um, 2012, engaged with HD, HDC staff looking at the best way forward. Um, there was coastal erosion and accretion assessments done back, in the, back then. Um, we submitted to the annual plan back in 2014, undertook feasibility studies, completed. Um, and a coastal erosion report by Tonkin and Taylor was completed as well. 2015, we submitted to the long-term plan um, and did preparation for the designation um, hearing and also accretion claim with, with HDC. Um, and then obviously post that has just been designation being approved in 2016 and 2020, the accretion claim coming through, which is sort of leaves us where we are today. Um, and then this just to finish off, this is um, the groups and organisations that are in full support of a new building for Surf Club, um, along with the submission I attached um, quite a few of the letters which you might have seen. Um, quite a few people uh, or groups are using this at the moment, so um, the colleges use our Surf Club. Waipei College is using it every week for a surfing program and they're storing their surfboards there. Um, the Rotary, we do an uh, education one day with them over the summer, they bring about 20 kids out. Um, so there's plenty of support out there for a new building on top of the whole community wanting to get behind us as well. And I think that's all. <laughs> the next side is going to say thank you, but the next picks have disappeared. So that's, that's all from us. I mean, as I said, as Liz has pointed out, the club's in a very good position. There's a, we've got a group of motivated, enthusiastic, we've been working enthusiastic members. Um, the club's in a strong financial position, um, and we're sort of keen to for the council to 
get on board, utilise us as much as we utilise you guys to get the building done. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Andrew. Thanks, Liz. Look, I, I'm not going to open up the questions because we could be here for another hour. Um, but I'd like to, um, you know, this has acknowledged that this has been a very much a long-term project and, and has um, occupied the minds of everybody um, in the Surf Life Saving Club for a long, long time. Um, and it's great that we've now got to a situation where we appear to be in a, in a place to be able to actually move this forward. So I know there's already been a lot of discussion around this table in, in, in terms of uh, how we approach this, and I'm sure um, you know your submission is welcome and well received. Thank you. Welcome, Nick. Sorry to um, hold you up. And um, I'll tell Michael that he's had been replaced by um, <laughs> someone with better hair, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, Councillor Ferguson's going to start us off, Your Worship. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm back here. Look, look, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes, um, first of all, to acknowledge the relationship that, that we have between Horizons and, and HTC. I mean, obviously, we exist through legislation and we've got different legislative um, requirements and, and responsibilities, but we're all here for the good of the community and, and having a, an open and, and uh, viable relationship at the council and people, at the mayor, at the chair, and, and staff is important. So, acknowledging that, I'm just going to take a minute to perhaps just talk through the lay of the land a, a wee bit, we common, common interest. Um, so, common opportunities, challenges, and, and interests. We, we've got an extensive coastal dune area, and, and there is um, so, some work happening in that space together, and, and the opportunity for more work. Um, we, we've heard about the S3 today, and, and that's a, working towards creating that as an iconic site for Horizons, and, and there's common interest there along with Dock. Um, there, there's a lot of land use change in, in the region and, and the impact of that land use change. Uh, transport is a key one. Um, we, we've got a, a regional public transport plan coming up and, and Councillor Jennings um, is going to be participating in that as your representative. Um, we've got some challenges around stormwater and, and what the future looks like with stormwater, and especially with some of the, the sensitive receiving environments. Um, with, with that stormwater. Climate change uh, is certainly on the radar. We, we now have a joint committee that, that Horofanua Council is a, a member of um, and, and some opportunity uh, through, through the Horizons LTP for increased funding in that space and the freshwater reform that's coming for it is, is landed and there's a lot of work for Horizons and, and obviously LPC2 um, which has landed and, and will be finalised very shortly, um, it does have an impact on, on the Horofanua and, and an impact on the lake. So I think just a bit of a, around the region, some of those common areas of interest and, and concern and opportunity on one final one, which is the, the Foxton drainage and, and the work going on in that area. I'll hand over to Nick to get into the detail. Uh, councillors, councillors, and thank you uh, for the chance to be here. I'm um, aware you've probably had a very long day, so I'll keep this uh, pretty short and sweet. Um, as Councillor Ferguson has said, I think we're really keen to, to, to continue the, the strong working relationship we have at all levels, and particularly as your district goes through perhaps the time of, of great opportunity, but also challenges as you grow um, with, with new development occurring. Um, and really keen to keep working with you as you go through that process, um, be that from big infrastructure projects um, particularly supporting uh, the Mayor and the Chief Executive in their work around the Otaki to North and Levin uh, Highway, but also as you think about infrastructure projects that support uh, the development of uh, things like housing um, in the future. Um, and, and, and really uh, thinking of that infrastructure um, as we head into fresh water reforms and three waters reform, 
obviously a time of a fair bit of uncertainty for for local government. Um, but would encourage council to think about how you apply um, essentially the new uh, hierarchy of obligations under the freshwater policy statement um, to your three waters work and your consenting work and your infrastructure planning. Um, and obviously Tamano Te Wai uh, sits at the top of that hierarchy uh, in government's new legislation. Um, and we'll all be thinking and working with uh, Hapu and Iwi around the region uh, as to how we apply that um, uh, that principle over the next uh, several years. Uh, in terms of new freshwater plans um, for Horizons, we need to notify a new freshwater plan uh, by 2024. Uh, so we'll need, be needing to work with you as a council and uh, with Iwi and Hapu and with members of your community uh, as we head towards formulating that, that new plan. Uh, as Councillor Ferguson also mentioned, um, really keen to keep that working relationship with you around climate change and uh, it's a really useful development to have a joint climate action committee now with all the mayors in the region uh, sitting on that committee. Uh, the first piece of major work that that committee is doing is a regional vulnerability assessment uh, which will look at our vulnerabilities both physical, economic uh, and social uh, to the impacts of climate change and uh, in the, the, the working relationship with your officers will be key as we head through that process and their ongoing support, uh, not so much financially but in terms of staff time, uh, is going to be critical uh, as that committee puts its work um, into action. Um, also recognise that, that central government is funding uh, some work going on in terms of freshwater improvement um, in Horafenua. And uh, again, just a thank you to your Mayor and your Deputy Mayor, I think, who've both been sitting on uh, the Jobs for Nature governance group uh, that's running that, that work. Um, and a final uh, note of, of thanks, really, um, uh, is around your ongoing support for the Enviro Schools projects uh, that occur throughout this district. So in summary, um, really keen to keep those working relationships going. Um, support you as you go through uh, your opportunities and challenges around district growth uh, and continue to work with you to prioritise um, from our end the regulation and from your end the construction of those big infrastructure projects. Uh, thank you, councillors. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Sam. Has anyone got any... Oh, who's first? Sorry, Nick, could you just turn yours off? Thank you. Um, thank you. And um, special thanks to Sam for your um, staying connected. Uh, you, uh, there's not really a meeting or public one you don't attend, and um, I think that's important. Uh, my question is, um, you were in the room for that last presentation. Um, I emphasise the words up there, no barriers. So I just want to be sure, and if you don't know, make sure that... Um, there's no further consent required. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how how that part works, but um, yeah, I just um, take that message back, please. Uh, Councillor Ferguson mentioned that very issue to me yesterday, so um, I'm just going to catch up with the, the Life Saving Club people after this and connect them to our planners just to make sure that that's all sorted. That's a brilliant. Just start me very briefly, Your Worship. Um, thanks, Nick and Sam, for uh, coming along and uh, presenting. Um, over the last couple of days, we've heard quite a bit of um, commentary from local environmental groups and the Tapu Fox and out around the Mount East group and the June Fields and whatnot, and, and a lot of comments, and, and I've witnessed it myself in the last, certainly in the last couple of years, uh, uh, um, a raised engagement from particular horizons. Your team, Nick, and, um, and Doc, um, supporting the work out there in terms of managing that, that sensitive environment. And I, I guess, and, and Sam's been a part of that as well, so I guess from a local point of view, just, just highlighting that engagement and the fact that, um, that there's a lot more work to do and, and really appreciate um, your guys' um, involvement that I've been involved with, and hopefully that can continue and, and strengthen that work that needs to be done in that area. So um, I think it's getting a lot more... Focus than it probably used to, and I think it's a good thing, and particularly with the, the challenges around the nature calls and stuff as well. So, really appreciate your engagement there. So. 
That's right. Yes, thank you, and, and again, just appreciation for the work done at regional level and acknowledgement, Sam, of your presence everywhere, uh, focusing particularly on Save Our River Trust, where you're always there. So we've created that asset in, in front of the new park there, and of course, within weeks of that, there was the encroachment of all the weeds coming back and so on. Could I ask you publicly, does regional council see a commitment to maintaining that asset in terms of weed control? So that, yeah, it's a conversation that I've certainly had and, and I guess at the moment when we look at the, the interaction around rivers, it is pro predominantly around scheme management and, and that's not part of a, a flood scheme. So that I mean that's the gap at the moment. So it's not it's not within the scope of services. Um, is perhaps the way to put it. I think we we had Robin Huppy was um, with us um, as part of our LTP discussions recently. So um, I think we're we're open to those ongoing conversations and working out where we can and can't solve problems together. Um, and so yeah, then let's keep the dialogue going and um, and figure out. Thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. And um, I too would like to endorse the comments um, made by the others uh, around uh, Sam's um, presence in being connected to us. It's been a really um, very good relationship already. And, and I know that at a governance level that the two bodies are a heck of a lot closer than they have been at any other stage, and, and, and Sam's a big part of that, so I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, but also um, the relationship that both organisations have right across the board, I think it has improved dramatically in my short time uh, in local government, and um, there's a lot of good work going on, and we are collaborating a heck of a lot better than we ever used to, and I hope that continues. So appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome, Sarah. Well, I'm a bit concerned you need tissues. Thank you. Um, you can sit. You're welcome. Well, to sit. I'll stand at the moment. Thank you're you. sure? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you for having me speak um, and giving us the time as a community to speak to you. Um, I just want to flip it over because I've got two speaking things. One is me and one is the community. So it'll be a bit blurred, but I'd like to start with the community, please, which is my next 10 centimetre, 10 minutes long. This is in case I cry. Which is mostly hoochie. Um, <clears throat> um, because um, it's, uh, I, I speak a lot to various things, and this is really new back into this my community, and I love it very much. And we feel that um, I feel that I have the weight of the community on my shoulders. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I do some work for the council. Um, we look after some gardens and we, um, um, and so we have some staff that um, work in the garden uh, in the gardens as well. And we're really proud of Horofenua and we're proud of our community. And um, I really love our community. So by <clears throat> some of the things I want to say, and I know that um, um, I don't wish in any way to hurt anybody because I know that you hurt me so... Um, they do their best everywhere. I just wanted to say that I don't wish to appear to be biting the can that feeds me, my family, my staff and their families. And I'm anxious that you understand this because it's really important that you know how much I care about my community and that the people, I've got two support people here today that can, um, care about our community in, in Manukau. Um, um, <clears throat> I also want to make it really clear that 
Um, and I wrote these things down because I can tend to wander off really easily on, 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 uh, when I'm speaking and it's fine when I'm speaking one to one. It's really bad in a formal situation like this. Nobody ever, ever, ever speaks for everybody. But in speaking to this submission, I represent the deep concerns of many in our community. Um, I, it's really important to do this properly. I'm sorry, I guess I knew this because I actually am. Uh, uh, we've spent, and many of you who know me and speak with me will see this as a quite a different person standing up here. It's so important to get this right. We've spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours working with Horapunua District Council and Waka Kotahi on to O2NL, and I'm speaking here to our submission, which is about State 01, but I just need to give you this background. Uh, Waka, Waka Kotahi's process has been in turn difficult, contemptuous of our attempt to engage. Um, they're especially bad with attempts made by quiet, older, disabled, nervous, and sometimes inarticulate members of our community. They've been really difficult to deal with. They've lied, occasionally they've been honest, they've delayed giving information, they've obfuscated, and they've intimidated us. And worst of all, they have irrevocably divided our community. Um, <clears throat> Um, this is why it's so important that you listen about what we need you to help us with this that I live in. Waka Kotahi have um, moved with stealth. There are many people in, in Waka Kotahi that I have respect for, and many people who have been kind, and many people who have behind the scenes have tried to help us, and many people who have given us confidential information to try to help us progress things with the O2NL. Um, They've fragmented, though, they've fragmented and they've corroded our community and they've separated us out. Um, <clears throat> so Monaco is, uh, Monaco is, you know, spread out everywhere. This South Monaco. Um, you better give me time check, I've only got three minutes left. Okay, please. Um, so we're spread out all over the place and there's beach people and they're a separate group and they're great and we do yays um, with each other and we care about each other. But, um, uh, as the O2NL project was being um, negotiated, um, there were horrible splits amongst the community, and it's very difficult to pull that community effort together. Um, and it's hard for me to say this, because I know you all individually, and I've talked to you, I've gone into your supermarkets, I know you from various business things, and I know you even people and impact. Dave McCorkendale, where are you? You should be here, such a good support person. It's hard for me to say this, but... Um, we, we feel we've been left adrift as a community a little bit by the council. Um, and I don't mean to hurt you or to uh, contravene the rules of the meeting, but I just need to say that, Bernie, that sometimes we feel um, abandoned. And that's why I said I, I don't wish to, to bite the hand that pays the paycheck, part of our paycheck, but I, I have to say this on behalf of our community. We've many times tried to make collaborative processes about the motorway and straight highway one, and, and some other issues, which, you know, there's, there's a bit of a, a wee wobble up on some development and that was going to happen, but, but we've sort of resolved all of those things, but we've felt left on our own about, um, about uh, the motorway and about state highway one. And it appears to us that for lots of reasons that you've had to concentrate on Levin and Foxton, or rather the end of the uh, no, no offence to Fox and people, but that end of the motorway and the communities there. Um, I noticed another thing that I have to say things about the past, which I won't, except we don't, as a community down in Monica, ask for a hell of a lot, like you were fantastic and there was a hazardous site for the railway line, which you helped turn into a park. We're really grateful for that. Thank you for that money. Thanks for the ability to do it. Shit, like, lots of um, community work got laid over there, lots of contributions from businesses outside of the area. It was a fantastic project. Thank you for that. Um, and also, I know that you're helping over in the sports grounds. I think it's a big volunteer effort, but I'm, I'm sure that you're dropping money onto that. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know lots of detail about that. But, um, but, we, and we, but we don't ask for a lot. And what we're asking for now is, is not so much... I mean, obviously, it will cost money if you could get it into your long-term plan. But it's more that your time of engagement, if you could spend some, some time with us, 
uh, who you don't look confused. If you could just spend, if we just need somebody, we just need some help with moving forward with um, Stack One, with the um, our community with our true help, then we just um, we want some, you know, some good people. I'm terribly sorry. It's really embarrassing to cry. It's difficult in the horror where everybody has conflicts of interest, and we all do, and we all understand that. But we just need, um, it's a small community, and we just need to pull together. We need to pull together with waka kotai. Waka kotai. Um, do you guys look at me like that? You might be pretty Um, we, sorry, sorry, fine. We can't, we can't find specific reference in the LTP to a state highway one strategy. Um, do you want to come and sit by me? Adam, thank you. Adam's, um, we've done hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of work on this. Um, uh, yeah, um, I just really, um, just could get this right. Um, transport is like, uh, you know, water, power, shelter, food production. And even if O2 and L goes ahead, and that's what actually really wobbled us, because as you know, O2 and L may not go ahead. And it's a big cock up for lots of people, especially Horofeta, um, obviously all of us. Um, and if that doesn't go ahead, it means it's even more important that we have a really, really good strategy amongst ourselves for State Highway 1. I couldn't see it in the long term plan. Um, you can say something if you want, but I, I didn't see it. Maybe it's, yeah. Um, because um, even if O2 and L goes ahead, we still have to rely on State Highway 1 for at least a decade. And, um, you know, when you get to my age, you have a shitload of friends around the place that um, are in government, in the treasury. So, you know, there are friends that know, you know, that communicate information. And you can imagine what the information is that we collect up. Um, I think that um, I think it's really important that we're all really super transparent with each other. That we could, that you guys could communicate with our community, could help us, even with um, the lovely guys that were sitting here before um, from Horizons. We've really struggled to make a relationship with Horizons about the pest control um, that we need in our area and some of the water problems that we have. Um, so we would really love you guys to help us. Well, because you've obviously got a brilliant relationship with them, and we would love to tail on to that, please. We struggle um, with those uh, relationships, and I think that it's, I think we're quieter. I've been so impressed with Fox and like that. They just bob up and down here all the time. They've got these fantastic presentations, and I feel that uh, this this presentation may seem amateur, amateurish, but I please feel that we we value your time. We don't want to bombard you with stuff. We just would like this to be. Um, to be our, um, our, our uh, uh, contact with you. It's not, we don't have a shopping list. We don't want a pool or a sports club or a whatever. We don't have a big list of stuff. Um, we just would like, um, and with all due respect, I say this, sort of like a change of attitude with consultative processes uh, with us. And so we would like some support. And we, 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 we what we're asking for, it doesn't, it's not that it will cost anything other than time, and I know time is expensive, but, um, but it's just a change of the way that you set out strategic um, or strategy statements. Um, they don't always appear to have an end. Like, there's a lot, I, I went over a lot, that we even, you know, the uh, strategy, uh, this was a community plan. Have you all read this? The Manukau Community Plan? That's interesting that you have, actually, but it's great. But some of the things that are supposed to be in the community but in the long-term plan aren't from there. So it's like strategies get written, and, but they don't, get, they don't seem to have a home or land. I think the term is landing. They don't seem to find a landing with a lot of strategies. And so it sort of makes them um, uh, difficult, to, um, uh, difficult to understand where the actual intention of them where the, where the landing of the intention is. Um, so that's sort of a background um, about why we made the submission. So this, uh, many of our communities said it's, oh, it, it's, they said it's a waste of time, that 
often just the council isn't focused on that end of the community because they've got lots of other problems around the other ends in, in the middle of the community. And um, and people, uh, there are also people who are a little bit too scared to make submissions. Some people are reliant on council for their income. And so they're, they are, they, they are, so I come to you truthfully with that. So a lot of us got together and then it, 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 we, we came up with a submission, which I hope you have all read because we took them around to people and we explained them and we said, if you want to, please send your submission and you can send it by email or you could drop it in. And um, I know a lot went with emails, I don't know how many, and this is a lot of stuff that we emailed. Some people did virtually email. I'm sure you've got, you've got lots. Um, I'd like to go over the submission if you'd like me to, but if you feel that you would rather just question me because you've read the submission really well, I'd really like to take those questions. I don't want to waste your time by reading something that you've already read. Oh my goodness. No, yes. we will have questions, so if that's easier, Sarah. Right. Yes, we will take, okay. give you questions yes. if that's I, easier. I, I just thought that might be, um, I can read it if, you, if that would be useful. No, there were a number of um, submissions made all you know, together. Yeah. The it odd one crossed amazing. out the odd line. Yeah, well, yeah um, correct. And, yeah, and you yeah. have to get people, and you can't get, sorry to interrupt you, but I'm just to say this, you can't worry about that detail and think that is indicating a split. It's just people oh. with their little tiny things. This is, um, it's the whole principle of working with us and, 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 and uh, sh like shining a light on the, and also we're not whiners or whingers, um, and so we don't, there's not a lot of noise that comes for us, but we feel a bit desperate. Understand. Do you want to start, Councillor Jennings? Yeah, look, I think, um, uh, um, thank you so much, Sarah, and really appreciate your passion. Um, for your community, and, and I guess I just wanted to put this to you and then just get you to confirm back that essentially this is what you're asking for, which is advocacy on behalf of the elected members and council staff around uh, short-term works that are needed on the current route right now to, to, to achieve some safety outcomes, right? Um, yes, correct. Second, direct... Um, advocacy around the Oatonel project as a whole, then advocacy around some aspects of the revocation process that will inevitably happen around the old Sahoe, and then anything that's not picked up as part of the bigger project or the revocation process, you want us to factor that into our long-term planning. Yes, because that Waka Kote, yep. sorry to interrupt, Sam, Waka Kote, they think that you guys... I just have to say what they think. They think your guys are off the board. Your eyes are off the board out there. And they, and so they, we, um, and you need, or rather we need, and I say, I say we because I always think of us as one. You know, like when we're doing garden work and I talk to Anne or us or that, I always think of us as we. I don't think like it's the council and us. I think of us as we. And I think that um, you need to start to push NZTA really hard on what they're going to do about State Highway 1 before you take it over. It's just critical that you get on top of them because they are, they, 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 the thought is that the intention is to do with the subdivision and the and OTO and, and, the, and the focus is here. And you can't be left, or rather we cannot be left with State Highway 1 as it is, especially for the following 10 years, uh, that even if O2 and L were to go ahead tomorrow, um, and I think that's really in the balance, we've already had um, information about some work we're doing related to O2 and L that's been cancelled today, this afternoon, just after three. So, um, on to side efforts. So we, we really, um, though that's for work that we do for a separate contract, and nothing to do with you guys, obviously to do with community um, and I think that um, this is like it's an imperative, it's a really urgent problem for us as a community Can I, can I say something? Sorry, you have to push your button It's pretty hard to sit at our end of the Kortafunua, the RC to sit there and watch government spend money on other projects throughout the country when we can see what's coming in over the next 10 years, which is a hell of a lot of traffic coming onto our road that 
it's, it's just going to be it's just going to be a lock point for all the traffic once the um, transmission gully and the next road out to uh, the Packets of Wataki have been built. It's just going to be a logger jam at our end of the road, and it's going to be for ten years because the, this road isn't going to be built for five years. It's not going to it's not going to start for five years if it starts, and it's not going to finish for another t- five years after that. That is ten years. So we're pleading to the council to, to get down there, bang on some doors, get this bloody expressway built, and get the get the the state highway one up to the standard that it needs to be to handle the traffic that's going to come into Levin. Uh, Treasury don't even have alarm bells for state highway one. Uh, and we'd like to work with you, like uh, Mrs. Mrs. Lee would like to work with you. Like um, there's a lot of people um, are looking at over there because you guys are the you know the guys in the cold face. There's a lot of people that really want to help in our village. Like lots of us, you know, have worked with various you know, There's lots of people with big businesses or they work with within Department of Internal Affairs or with government and there's people related to Treasury. They all want to help, but they feel we feel cut off. Like there's a big opaque glass between us and you guys. We we need to you know, we have to be united because then we'll stand. And it's, I know it's a really old-fashioned thing, but divided we will fall. And, and um, infrastructure needs to talk to us and, and us to you guys. And, and you guys, we need to all link up better. As a business, you know, as, as, as governance and, and management and people, we need to work better together on this. This is a really, really big project. It's not fun. It's really, really important. And, and like I was just trying to say before, I'm trying to get you to read between the lines. You know, a lot of information dribbles in over the dinner parties down in Wellington, and it's not good for us. I would really, uh, all of us, we want to work with you with this. You can ask more questions. And it, it has to be, what we're talking about here has to be council led. I mean, we've, we've, yeah. we've, we've been sitting with. Waka Kotahi for six years. I've been I've been up here. I've, I've been in Manako for six years, and for six years, for the last six years, I've gone to meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting with Waka Kotahi, and it's all just smoke and mirrors, and it's all bullshit. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm sorry, Bernie. I have sorry to for the language, but we know that you've had the same I'm issues, intriguing. and we know all this with your issues. But but you know you need uh, you need people who um, you need people to help articulate how we feel. Like you're constrained by your rules and regulations and all the other stuff and you're constrained because you're employed and you know employment constraint. We're not. Um, and also often we're approached by media to comment on HDC or Waka Kotahi or whatever even though everyone's on the media was looking at that point but we never do that. So we are deeply respectful of all of you and deeply respectful, look up guys in the pack there, of all of you. No, but really, it's so we want this to work. And a lot of you um, know us. So it's like, it's, and I'm sorry, it must seem weak. We're not here wanting an item. Except you never gave us a pity $4,000 for our haul that we asked for last year. We don't ask for anything. There's millions of dollars going out the place. So I couldn't believe today, but anyway. I just want to say, that doesn't matter, we forgive you. But, but it's just... Um, but this, and we would like to have regular meetings. We even started with a regular meeting. We started with a, with a meeting. Remember last year? We had that meeting in that room. Yeah. And that social person was going to help us. And what well, was we it? Have and what? Nothing happened. Two monthly meetings and then they just disappeared. They just disappeared. And we want that. We don't mind making the meeting times or sending the Google Maps or with the doc things. But we please include us. Are there any more questions, Bernie? Because I think I'm up to my time. And do you want to say anything, Adam? We stopped, we stopped yeah, the clock ages ago, Sarah. Yeah. It's all about trying to get some advocacy from yeah. the hut, the, the hut, <laughs> the Hurufenua <laughs> District Council with Waka Kotahi, because at the end of the day, you've got to start hammering them to get the money. Otherwise, they're going to give it somewhere else. It's all about going down there, whacking on doors and talking to people and securing the funding that's needed to do this job properly. And because if you don't do it, it ain't going to happen. And we're, we're going to end up yeah. with a big problem. And we all know it's coming. And we've played nice with, you know, we've had them at our place. 
We've given them food and drink. We've had meetings, you know, and at our place, Linda, um, oh, I don't need to tell you this detail, detail, you don't need to hear, but please include us within your committees. Please do that, please. Sorry. Oh, turn it off, because then, oh my God. <laughs> Press me. All right, are there some more questions? Yes, yes. I'm oh, waiting. Yes, you are a very polite job. Off you go. I know, it's unusual. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate it. Love the passion. It has struck a chord. But the meetings, and I know you said you were going to have meetings every month or two months or something. Sometimes for us as elected members, we don't hear anything for a year or things go quiet and they have gone very quiet. Do you want to have meetings when there's nothing new happening? Is that important no, for you? No, of course not. But, but no, do you, or, or what do you think? You. Like, yeah. But what we want is to be included. We know these discussions are happening because you leak like a ship. So everybody does. So we know what's happening. And so it's really important that you, and everybody leaks like a ship. Everybody does. It's just, look, it's the world. You know, honestly, Parliament. It's just, but it's it's okay. And Treasury, you know, we know things that, you know, like it's like really bad. Don't tell me this. Oh, you've been drinking too much. Don't do it. But we want that information. But you need to, you need, um, please could you include us, or you guys, could you include us in, so that we can sit there, and obviously I won't be crying all the time, but sometimes when you've got Waka Kotahi there, and they're actually, they're up here, you know, in the space up here in this clouds, telling you things that are not, you know, you, you need, sometimes you just occasionally need a voice that's a person picking up the pieces in the village of the people whose lives just go up and down and up and down, and we are really, truly affected. Now, you guys know where things are in our township, which is really great, because some, some of you didn't, and it's great that you do know. But every time Waka Kota, he comes to us, they've got a new team. And as you know, they were very rude to another person, <coughs> and that person went for training. It was a really appalling thing. We had you, and we had a lady from Roding, Christine, I think, who was there at the same time. So it, it, we, we, so do you understand? The number of the issue is, please keep us completely involved with the We don't want to have patsy meetings. We don't want lollies thrown to us. We don't want any of that stuff. We want to be included all the time, and we want to know how you are pushing forward. Please send emails that say, we are doing this, or Daniel Hager said this, or you, Mr. Peel, has said this, or David has said this. It's really, just just include us, because we're not, we're not stupid, and we're really useful to you. We get the message loud and clear, uh, Thank Sarah. You. Thank you. Don't and, me off. Um, Councillor Mitchell would like to say. Yeah, Sarah, I'm just wondering, like, I go to other community group meetings, and they are monthly, and it's on my diary, but with you guys, I'm sort of never quite sure when you're having a meeting or whether you want Wayne or me to be there or Daniel Haig to come down or what do you Well, like? sometimes, <laughs> thank you for asking the question, but sometimes it's it's a total utter, and I'd have to use the, I'll just use the B word, Bernie, it's a bloody waste of your time because sometimes they just, you know, people waffling on, oh, we get for rent for this and we do all these things. We want more specific, intense, we'll, we'll tell you when we've got an issue that you need right. to. But we need you. We were relying on you getting back after those that engagement. We just want you not to waste your time coming to things except when you want us to vote for you, you know, all some of those meetings. But yeah. But um, um but we want you to to um to engage on the on the really important issues and keep us in that loop. So who's in charge? Is it is it I know that we only like to talk to these people, but it's not who's in charge of all the communications with Waka Hote? Is it Can you, could you communicate with us, please? It's going to say a few words. Through you, Your Worship, and it's not normal for me to speak um, oh, yeah. in a hearing like this, but um, <clears throat> just noting the, the message that's been received, but I think there's some underlying messages that Sarah's um, relayed to us that actually are in the context of some discussions that we've had over the last couple of weeks um, around um, the 
project work that's um, being undertaken by Waka Kotahi. And I think one of the, the outcomes that was uh, identified a week or so ago is how we can get everyone around the table within our community that's affected by the work or the proposed work with Waka Kotahi. Because one of the things that I think is occurring is that there are, as Sarah says, um, different discussions going on throughout our community um, with Waka Kotahi and there's not a collective approach. So um, I think the first message is that somehow we actually have to get the collective voice together which is not with Waka Kotahi, it's with the Harafanel community, which includes Manukau, Iwi, um, Kopurua, um, Putatafu, and just have a discussion around the table around where, where each of us are, and then we can work out how we can actually work together. And it's not against Waka Kotahi, it's to actually work with Waka Kotahi to actually get the outcomes that we're looking for. So I'll just offer that, um, Your Worship. Thank you. Um, and Sarah, look, you... Waka Kotahi, um, David and I and Brent were in their office on Friday afternoon. We are trying to put as much pressure on them as possible. They have told us that they are developing a, a regional framework that they, uh, which is new and there will be different people than what you've seen before, but people we know who they are. So we, And they've already said to us that their main aim is to try and build those relationships back to where they were. So don't, for one minute, think that we've forgotten you or that we're not keen to make sure that they don't know what we're thinking in this community. But as David suggested, there does need to be a bit of a roundtable uh, hooey in terms of where we go from here and the, and the united front that we present to them. Um. Okay, in the end of this, I just want to say that we know that you all try really hard, and we know that you guys try hard. And Kevin, I know that all of you guys try hard because I know what team you have. And I, we, we thank you guys for trying to work all the time with us in our community. The same for David, because these are guys we see. I know that you guys are governance, but you, we see management all. And then you know, like we call ourselves in our, in our work, the bottom feeders, but you know what I mean. So, um, Thank you, um, anyway. Sarah. Okay. I'd like I'm to finished. congratulate you on not having to, um, you spent six and a half minutes before you said um, a swear word, so I congratulate you on that. Did I go um, six and a half minutes? Six and a half minutes, yeah, Sorry. I would say that would be probably a record for a conversation uh, with you. Um, and... We do sincerely, though, thank you for um, coming and giving us that. Uh, we, we have certainly got the message and okay, appreciate thanks, thanks. your feedback. So thank you. For, and all I ask is that we're included deeply in the conversations. Yep. Message received. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thanks. So, uh, councillors, this brings us to uh, the end of um, three days of hearings. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your participation the fact that, uh, and the engagement that you uh, had over these three days. Um, can I certainly pass a big vote of thanks to um, this lady on my right, um, uh, who I would not have been able to... Um, get through these three days of envy for her, but also all those um, sitting over to our right and over the back, thank you very much. Um, it's gone very smoothly and um, thank you. So I declare um, the hearings of submissions on the draft long-term plan for 2021-2041 closed.